Uh, welcome to everybody. This is the CPC National Finals. Uh, we are looking at a great competition today with the winners from the uh, CPC semifinals back in the spring. Uh, before we get started, I just want to go through real quickly and thank all of our judges. Uh, these were all the team leaders for the different divisions at the semifinals competition. I've gone through the whole series of the preliminary judging, the on-site judging, uh, and judging for this. So we want to thank all of them for their time. Uh, and in a nod to one of my good friends, we're going to go in reverse alphabetical order for this. Uh, so uh, from the judging group, we can't have them uh, video in for this, but uh, Charlotte Wills from Highland Hospital, Alameda Health System, thank you. Uh, Kay Takanaka from University of Texas at Houston. Stephanie stokes Bazelli from Henry Ford Health System. Uh, Antonia Quinn from SUNY Downstate, who's going through an LCME accreditation visit, so thank you, Antonia. Uh, Gary Pollack from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Greg Politis from Washington University in St. Louis. And Joel Mole from Virginia Commonwealth University. So thank you all of you for judging during this. Uh, we know it's extra time for everyone, and these are really the expert judges in the country right now, so thank you to everyone for being part of this. Uh, and I think we are ready to go. Thank you again. I, I mentioned this a minute ago, but thank you to Tina. She is the mastermind behind all of this and has orchestrated all of the pieces of this. Uh, and to Deanna and the entire CORD staff for their support with CPC, uh, both over the years and especially for today's competition. So uh, without further ado, Tina, I guess we'll get ready to move on into to round one. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Matt McCauley. I'm a PGY4 at Northwestern Emergency Medicine. And us emergency medicine doctors, we can be a pretty paranoid bunch. I have mentors that see the specter of pulmonary embolism in every single tachycardic patient. They're obsessed, but they're not alone. We all set out into the uncharted waters of our waiting rooms searching for badness. We talk ourselves down from the hallucinations of a cold aortic dissection in benign chest pain. We see the ghosts of myocarditis in every pediatric URI. CPC itself, it demonstrates this obsession with the rare and the dangerous. Disseminated TB, late stage syphilis, botulism. We spend our careers searching for these zebras like they're the white whale of Herman Melville's famous novel. And I'm not trying to tell you to take leadership advice from Captain Ahab, but sometimes getting to the right answer means hunting down that beast that haunts your nightmares and yielding to that obsession. And today, our white whale comes in the form of a 60-year-old male who is found laying awake on the sidewalk. The only sign of trauma that they're seeing is an abrasion to the back of his head, which the patient said didn't happen today. The patient is ambulatory, but requires quite a bit of help to stand without assistance. He's confused, too. He can be heard counting out loud in the back of the EMS call. On arrival, he's tachycardic to the one teens, systolic's in the one teens as well. He's breathing in the mid-20s, and he's setting 95% without any extra oxygen. He's afebrile, and his real six vital sign, his blood glucose, is in the middle 200s. The patient has a lot of difficulty providing a history, but after a lot of fishing, the team is eventually able to gather that, yes, the patient fell, but it wasn't today. He lives in some type of senior living facility, and at the very least, he takes metformin. He's unable to endorse or deny any other medical or medication history. Our patient is diaphoretic, thin, confused, and is really starting to draw attention to himself in the emergency department. He's got abrasions over much of his skin, including a large one on his parietal scalp, but there's no bony step off, hematoma, or other deformity there. His pupils are mid-range and reactive, and the rest of his head, ear, nose, and throat exam demonstrates moist mucous membranes. His neck doesn't have any bony step off or deformity, and it's pretty supple and non-tender, full range of motion. Our patient is taking rapid, deep breaths in between his fractured sentences out of these clear sounding lungs. His heart rate's regular, there's no obvious murmur, and his belly is falling and rising with the tide of his breathing, but it's ultimately non-tender, non-distended. His extremities are warm and without edema. Our patient is mumbling kind of incoherently throughout the interview, but after a lot of attempts, the team is able to show that he can state his age, his name, and his location. He can identify all the items on a stroke skill card, and he ultimately has intact perennial nerves and strength throughout. His reflexes are within normal limits, and there's no inducible bonus. Our patient gets a quick bedside EKG, 
the venous blood gas with electrolytes. Before his blood tubes come back from the lab, he's shipped off to radiology where he gets a chest x-ray and a quick CT of his brain. And upon turning the room, he gets a second set of vital signs. This with one liter of lactator ringers having already run in. His first blood tube results with his CBC. And with this, his care moves forward. He receives an additional liter of crystalloid and multiple antibiotics. As if lost at sea, his chemistry panel takes forever to come back. But when it does finally result, it comes with his hepatic function panel and a host of his other labs. Now, just when our team seems adrift in drowning in all this information, a lifeline comes from the lab and the diagnosis is confirmed. Hey everybody, I'm Katie Lopez. I'm representing Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Medical, or in Boston Massachusetts, uh, where I'm working at Tufts Medical Center right now. Thanks Dr. McCulley and team for a really hard but great case. Um, so I'm gonna start with reviewing what we know about the patient. He's found down on the ground with not much history. Um, he is altered and able to mumble out just a little bit of information. He is living in a senior living facility, and yes, he is on metformin, but that's just about all we get. On exam, he's notably normotensive um, with a normal temperature, a little bit tachycardic, and definitely tachypneic. He's very thin and he's got these abrasions. Um, like Dr. McCauley noted, he is able to say maybe ones from a while ago, maybe some are new. And more than anything, the scariest thing is he's diaphoretic with this rapid, shallow, deep breathing that we refer to as small breathing. And although he's altered, he really has a non-focal neuro exam, negative stroke scales, intact cranial nerves, able to follow commands just a little wobbly on his feet, acting maybe a little intoxicated with some slurred speech. Okay, we got some data here to review, including a chest x-ray with no really obvious cardiopulmonary pathology, as well as a head CT in the setting of a trauma in an altered elderly person, really looking for any intracranial hemorrhage, but we have no evidence of bleeding, no evidence of infarct, and an overall normal symmetric head CT of the brain. Okay, now we've got an EKG to review. Here, we've got a tachycardic rate with a sinus rhythm with a P for every QRS. We are up and leaves one in AVF revealing a normal access. And yes, I'll go ahead and do it. Sign, timed, damped, si timed and signs, timed and um, signed, no stemming. But as we go ahead and look at that ST segment a little bit more, it looks like those T waves are kind of really sloping up and I definitely wouldn't wanna sit on them. So I would call this peaked T waves, and I would be thinking about hyperkalemia on this patient. Additionally, when we look at his intervals, looking at that PR segment as well as that QRS, those look normal. But when we look at that R to R interval and look about halfway in between, we find that QTC is more than halfway between that R to R, revealing a prolonged QTC. And in a patient with no real inciting meds that we know and no hereditary information that we know, I'd be thinking about hypocalcemia in this patient. All right, we've got a ton of, of labs to look at, including a really profound leukocytosis to 32,000 with an extremely abnormal differential, 29% neutrophils, low lymphocytes, low monocytes. What the heck is making up the rest of this differential? We're not told. We had normal cardiac enzymes, normal TSH and magnesium, and a profound phosphate at 12.2, super elevated, as well as an exceedingly high lactic acidosis at 8.5. Thankfully, we have a negative ETOH and a negative beta-hydroxybutyrate. Overall, unremarkable LFTs, not told albumin or protein, but we're thinking hypocalcemia here because of that EKG. Additionally, we had that hyperkalemia that we thought we had with the EKG changes, as well as an acidotic, P, uh, acidotic bicarb at 12 and an elevated creatinine at 2.5, which I would think is an acute kidney injury in this patient who's on metformin. He should not have a CKD and be on metformin. So we're calling this an acute kidney injury, as well as hyperglycemia. And then we've got it. We've got a VBG with acidosis. So that's right. We've got an acid-base disorder and we've got to do a little bit of math to figure out what's going on. 
first step is going to be, do we have an acidemic or an alkalotic patient? And that's going to be based on the pH less than or greater than 7.4. He's at 7.2, so we know, yes, he is acidemic. Additionally, we're going to figure out, is this acidosis a metabolic or a respiratory acidosis? And we do that by looking at the relationship of the PCO2 and the pH. Is the PCO2 and the pH going in opposite directions? We think respiratory. If they're going in the same direction like in our patient, a low pH with a low POC, PCO2, we're thinking about a metabolic acidosis. And we know when we think about metabolic acidosis, we've got to figure out, is there an anion gap or not? And so we'll go back to our chalkboard with this one and do a little bit of math. And yes, our patient has a high anion gap at 31. So he has the almighty high anion gap metabolic acidosis. But we can't just stop there. We got to figure out, does he have appropriate respiratory compensation? So to do this, we're back to that chalkboard, figuring out our winter's formula and what our expected PCO2 should be. It should come out to be around 26 based off of that bicarb but our patient's PCO2 is 35, which is exceedingly high. This means our patient also has a respiratory acidosis with those deep diaphoresis, small breathing. We know our patient is tiring out and this is impending doom for our patient. Lastly, because it's CPC finals and we wanna make sure there's no other funny business going on, we do our step five, which is gonna be our delta delta. Does the change in the anion gap a contribute or attribute the change in the bicarb. So we look at the difference in the normals from the bicarb and the difference in the normals from the anion gap, and it comes out to be about 19 and 12. Thankfully, that ratio is somewhere between one and two, and that means no other funny business going on. We have a high anion gap metabolic acidosis and only a respiratory acidosis going on. So let's think about these puzzle pieces we're dealing with. We have an altered patient clinically. We have an acute kidney injury, a high white blood cell count with an abnormal differential, high, high phosphate, high potassium, presumably low calcium, and that's right, a high anion gap metabolic acidosis, which is the best contributor to the mnemonics in the medical field. So I think this is where we have to start with our differential. Should we go ahead and dive head first into some mud piles or maybe add on a cat for some thoroughness? Or maybe we'll get jiggy with a little bit of gold marks, but it's 2020 and things are getting pretty weird. So I'm gonna simplify it into ketones, uremia, lactate or toxins contributing to this. All right, so let's look at the ketones. In a diabetic patient with hyperglycemia, we have to think about DKA. What about an altered guy found on the sidewalk, maybe AKA with alcoholic ketosis? Or a guy living in a senior living facility that's thin and maybe on that tea and toast diet, maybe starvation ketosis. But we've got a negative beta hydroxybutyrate, the largest ketone in the body. So I'm gonna say probably not ketones. What about uremia? The patient is definitely undergoing an AKI, but with an azotemia of only 38, it's probably not the main thing going on here. All right, it's almost Halloween, so we got to talk about those scary things like lactate and toxins. With most toxins causing high anion gap metabolic acidosis from a lactic acidosis. And I think we hit the nail on the head here because our patient has a lactate of 8.5. Let's talk about what could be causing that. Two main types, and that's going to be dependent on oxygen delivery, with type A lactic acidosis being inefficient oxygen delivery. And when we think lactate, you got it. We think sepsis, right? Could our patient be flooded with bacteremia? He's got a lactic acidosis, a leukocytosis. He's altered, of course. And our, our colleagues, Dr. McCauley and team, definitely treated him with broad spectrum antibiotics. But what is his source? Based on their antibiotics, or based on their antibiotics they gave, maybe meningitis. Thankfully, we have a very clear chest x-ray with no evidence of pneumonia. We've got a soft, non-tender abdomen. We've got no rashes. And notably, we are missing the hardest test to get in the emergency room of all time. That's a urinalysis. Of course, I would want a urinalysis on this patient, and I would definitely want to rule out urosepsis, probably a lumbar puncture, and blood cultures. But in a patient that has no real profound shock or fever, Yes, give them the, those broad spectrum life-saving antibiotics, but it's probably not sepsis. What about complete muscle hyperreactivity causing inadequate oxygenation and high lactic acidosis and a seizure, leading to altered mental status afterwards with maybe some old abrasions from old seizures as well? 
but we see seizures all the time in the emergency department. And none of my seizure patients are Kussmaul breathing and diaphoretic and it have this prolonged altered period. So I'm gonna say probably not seizure. Lastly, we wanna think about focal ischemia. In an elderly guy, we wanna think about mesenteric ischemia or a limb ischemic, an ischemic limb but with a sinus rhythm, soft non-tender abdomen, and well-perfused extremities, I'm gonna say probably not here. Okay, so it's probably not an, an oxygen delivery issue, but what kind of lactates can you get with adequate oxygen delivery? The most notable is gonna be with liver failure, right? When we have decreased clearance, but he's got a great work in liver, so we're gonna say probably not. What about exogenous or endogenous beta-2 stimulators like epinephrine or albuterol, but in no evidence of profound shock here and no obvious medications that have been given, I'm gonna say probably not. Okay, we have to think about thiamine and the undifferentiated lactic acidosis. And in a guy that probably doesn't have the best diet around, very thin, I would definitely think about loading this guy with thiamine, but with no obvious wet or dry berry berry and really a diagnostic diagnosis of exclusion, I'm going to say probably not here. Okay, that leaves us with toxins, and every good CPC case has to end with a good poisoning, right? This is the finals. So what could our patient have been poisoned by? Could it be the only words he was able to mutter to the EMS as they got there? Could this be a metformin-induced lactic acidosis? Of course it could, right? With even the slightest AKI, metformin can build up to toxic doses and murder the mitochondria, leading to high lactic acidosis, altered mental status. Usually we see kind of some GI upset, and I would definitely want to get renal involved, but as a diagnosis of exclusion and really no clinical way to prove it, I would say probably not metformin. What about salicylates? Has he lathered his old abrasions with some wintergreen oil, or is he popping some aspirins to get rid of all of those senior living facility pains? Maybe this would lead to inhibition of the electron transport chain at toxic levels, right? Leading to altered mental status, hyperthermia, some tinnitus, and that's right, direct effect on the medulla, leading to a respiratory alkalosis. Oh, thank goodness we already did all of our math. We do not have a respiratory alkalosis, nor do we have hyperthermia or the classic tinnitus. So I'm gonna say probably not salicylate toxicity, but definitely get the levels clinically. Oh, Frank Gallagher, how I wanted you to overdose on a toxic alcohol. Maybe a little senior living facility moonshine or found down on that sidewalk that was right next to a garage with antifreeze with ethylene glycol you definitely appear to be intoxicated and maybe have been in the past and that's your old abrasion. But really with methanol poisoning, we would expect to see some visual changes which we're not seeing. Additionally, with ethylene glycol, maybe that urinalysis we're missing would give us some calcium oxalate crystals and that's causing the hypocalcemia and that prolonged QTC. But I'm gonna say, probably not here, but definitely give that fomepazole and talk and send out those toxic alcohol levels if you can. But I'm going to say probably not because I think we're ignoring the huge elephant in the room on this case. What do we do with this elevated white blood cell count with this absurd differential? What is accumulating the rest of this differential? Could it be eosinophils? Maybe. Could it be basophils? Maybe, but probably not. What if what if it was rapidly growing, quickly dividing, immature blast cells leading to the worst toxin of all time, cancer? What if this is a hematologic malignancy with those rapidly dividing cells undergoing Warburg effect where they forego aerobic glycolysis and enter into lactic fermentation causing the worst type B lactic acidosis around? And with these rapidly growing, rapidly dividing cells, our body has nothing else to do but to lyse them. Usually occurring, undergoing a chemotherapy, tumor lysis syndrome can occur spontaneously with a high burden of leukemia or lymphoma. And it's the only unifying diagnosis here. We've got a high white blood cell count with an abnormal differential from a hematologic malignancy leading to the Warburg effect with a high lactate leading to a high anion gap metabolic acidosis with tumor lysis syndrome leading to high, high phosphate levels, high potassium, low calcium, high uric acid leading to an acute kidney injury and clinically presenting with altered mental status.
I would get a peripheral blood smear as my diagnostic test of choice to identify those blast cells, identify that hematologic malignancy, and make my clinical diagnosis of tumor lysis syndrome. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that wonderful discussion. When we last left our patient, he presented confused, tachypneic, a little bit of respiratory distress with some tachycardia. His lab showed a leukocytosis, an ion gap metabolic acidosis with incomplete respiratory compensation. Yeah, he had a lactic acidosis, but was that enough to explain his anion gap of 31? His CT brain is unremarkable, and his chest X-ray is ultimately unhelpfully read as edema versus pneumonia versus atelectasis in the correct clinical setting. It's not DKA, and our team is spoiling about like a man thrown overboard. Is it meningitis? Is it sepsis? Tumor lysis syndrome is entertained on a new leukemia. But when all this discussion is going on and labs get thrown into the computer, a lifeline comes from the lab and they land the diagnosis. His aspirin level is just a hair under 70. The patient agrees he's been taking full dose cardiac aspirin multiple times a day for ongoing back pain for weeks. And with the help of just a little bit of ketamine, the first month intern lands a harpoon sized catheter in the patient's right neck and dialysis is initiated in the emergency department. He's discharged on hospital day six after only a single run of dialysis. Now, chronic salicylism is truly a toxicologic white whale. So let's make sure before you head out into the stormy waters of your emergency room that you're well versed in the identification and the management of aspirin toxicity. Now, you're gonna find aspirin in way more cases than your standard cardiac Bayer stuff. You're gonna see it in oil and wintergreen, in BC powder, goodies powder, et cetera, and migraine. These are all in these giant open containers in every home in the United States. And it's one of our scariest overdoses. Lethal ingestions can be at only 100 to 150 gram, milligrams per kilogram, and toxic um, syndrome start to manifest themselves at relatively low levels with the final common pathway of toxicology, seizure coma death occurring at only 75 milligrams per deciliter. And if the patient's taking this chronically, these symptoms can manifest themselves at even lower levels. So your over-relying on your levels can lead you to underestimate the degree of toxicity. And part of what makes chronic solicitism identified or otherwise so dangerous is it can be easily misidentified as another common emergency. Patients present with altered mental status, low-grade fevers, respiratory distress, their exams can demonstrate pulmonary edema, their labs show high glucose, high leukocytes, AKIs. It's easy to see how you can knee-jerk to a diagnosis of DKA, a meningitic or pneumonia patient that also has sepsis. But the key to not missing this here and to not miss aspirin toxicity acute or chronic is to force yourself to think about it. Like Ahab's great fish, it can never be too far from your mind. You have to call, have a call to you whenever a patient has respiratory distress or a metabolic acidosis that you can't quite explain. Similarly, anytime a patient has an anion gap that you don't understand, just send off an aspirin level to get it off your list. And of course, with any ingestion, just send an aspirin level with the rest of your workup. And our goal here isn't just to get aspirin out of the body, it's to keep it out of the brain and out of the tissues because if aspirin gets in the brain, your patient's gonna seize, and if your patient seizes, they're gonna die. And you want help with that, and your friendly neighborhood toxicologist can help guide you to shore. They can help you interpret the levels, the indications for dialysis, and the indications for decontamination. You see, aspirin is famous for causing these big pharmacobezers that hang around the stomach forever, leading to a low basal level of poison. So, a cooperative patient's a good candidate for multi-dose activated charcoal here. You gotta be careful because these patients can vomit and lose their mental status. And charcoal in the lungs is bad, but it's not as bad as aspirin in the brain. As we mentioned before, aspirin directly causes a respiratory alkalosis with rapid breathing, at least until the patient tires up. It also uncouples oxidative phosphorylation. This process leads to the creation of a great deal of heat. These two processes together mean an ocean of insensible losses for your patients. They're gonna be multiple liters of behind on their fluid status. So you wanna make sure you're gonna make it rain. You wanna be liberal with your fluid resuscitation and choose a balanced crystalloid like lactated ringers or plasmolite to avoid worsening the acidosis. 
And once you've gotten your resuscitation and your contamination on board, you want to make sure you're managing that acidosis. Because it's not just the aspirin here that's causing problems. The shift towards anaerobic metabolism leads to a build of lactic acids and keto acids. And these all contribute to the acidotic sea that your patient is swimming around in. And the physiology here is pretty complex, but the key to remembering it is the non-ionized form of aspirin easily diffuses into tissues in the brain where it causes trouble. And this non-ionized form of aspirin increases as the pH gets more and more acidic. This means you want to make the blood as basic as possible. Now it's time to push an amp or three of bicarb and hang a liter of isotonic bicarb running at about twice maintenance. And while you're making the serum basic, you want to make the urine basic as well. Because when you make the urine basic, you're also serving to enhance elimination. Because the unionized form of aspirin is going to get stuck in the urine and out of the body. You want to target a urine pH of about seven and a half. And keep in mind that tiny increases can have exponential increases on the patient's ability to get the aspirin out. And while we're talking about the beans, we want to keep a close eye on the patient's potassium. Because when you have low potassium, the body is going to exchange protons for potassium in the urine. And that means that if you have low K, you're just counteracting your body's efforts to make the urine as basic as possible. And while you're keeping an eye on the potassium, you also want to keep an eye on the patient's blood sugar. Patients with aspirin toxicity can have relative cerebral hypoglycopenia. And this means that at normal glucose levels, the brain is just not seeing enough sugar. So if they're altered, that's probably why. You may have to push an amp or so of dextrose up front, but keep in mind that your bicarb drip is going to be in D5 water. Now, I might have to remind you about the potassium and the glucose in these cases, but I really hope I don't have to remind you about the dangers of innovating here. In Moby Dick, Starbuck warns his crew that the fearless man is far more dangerous of a comrade than a coward. And you should be cowardly about innovating in aspirin toxicity. It's often not the answer. These patients have massive minute ventilations and a ventilator is simply not gonna match that type of respiratory compensation. If you do have to intubate these patients, pray that you've had time to resuscitate with multiple liters of crystalloid and amps of bicarbonate. And if you do drop a tube, you wanna make sure you're maintaining their minute ventilation while keeping a very, very close eye on their end tidal CO2 and their blood gases to ensure you haven't sent them spiraling down to Davy Jones locker by removing their respiratory compensation. But ultimately, a lot of these severe cases are just going to rely on nephrology, getting your patient into a lifeboat and putting them on dialysis. And the levels are important. You got to remember that a level over 100 or a level over 90 with impaired renal function is going to buy your patient a seat on the dialysis chair. And that a chronic congestion is going to warrant your nephrologist's attention at even lower levels. But it's not just the numbers game. If your patient is altered or they start developing pulmonary edema that precludes their further respiratory um, resuscitation with fluid, it's probably time for the dialysis team to set sail. And of course, if your pH doesn't budge despite your best efforts, it, dialysis is probably the only way to get those evil humors out. Now, this was my case, and I would love to tell you that I walked out of the room with the diagnosis in hand. I did, however, walk out of the room saying, I think this is DKA. But we'll send an aspirin level because he's hot, he's altered, he's breathing fast, and it's my white whale. Anchoring is our favoring of our initial diagnosis despite information coming to light that should cause us to rethink our thinking. I anchored hard on DKA in the first few moments of this case despite learning that he was a type one diabetic that didn't, type two diabetic that didn't take insulin. And anchoring gets even easier when you consider it in the guise of other biases that we can have. DKA is incredibly common. It's easy to put this on any patient that's hyperglycemic and a little bit altered, maybe breathe a little bit fast. And this patient is like, ultimately, we came to the right conclusion here because not because we looked through all the lab levels super, super carefully, but because of this obsessive idea that aspirin toxicity could be lurking beneath the waves of any unexplained acidosis. And when it comes to aspirin, it does pay to be obsessive. Otherwise, you're going to miss it. If you do land your white whale, you want to make sure you're filling them with fluid and bicarbonate while you're keeping an eye on their sugar and their potassium. If you remember that you can't always trust your levels, but you can always trust your toxicologist, and you search for reasons to dialyze them while avoiding innovating them, you may be able to distill your patient hope. Thank you guys so much.
Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, uh, welcome to this uh, today's case of a very, very, very strange, strange presentation of a case, or a str strange, strange case, I should say, excuse me. Um, so the case that we have is a 36 year old female. She was coming to the emergency department. Uh, she, she was uh, just coming with, a, with, with fever. She had a little, little bit of shortness of breath, a little bit of a headache and some upper extremity edema, uh, just this strange kind of swelling in her arms. She actually was brought in by a friend who says, you know what, she's, she's totally my friend. I, I, I love her dearly, but she is just acting weird. I don't know what's going on. Uh, she's just been a little weird lately. Um, so it turns out that actually a couple days earlier, she came into the emergency department with a bunch of vi uh, upper respiratory infectious type symptoms, very nonspecific, very mild. Uh, she ended up getting prescribed azithromycin and uh, before that, everything had been totally normal. She was in her usual course of health. Things had been fine. Um, uh, but otherwise, for her current presentation at this time, uh, she was just a little too altered to get any sort of a, of a good history on. Uh, her medical history was notable for uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, she had been pregnant pre previously and diagnosed with peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, history of depression, and then also history of Chiari malformation type 1. Her surgical history included a, a tubal ligation and bilateral total hip and knee replacements for severe, severe arthritis. Uh, medications that she was taking for her peripartium uh, cardiomyopathy, she was still taking a carvedilol, digoxin, and lisinopril. Uh, for her arthritis, she had been prescribed methotrexate and prednisone. And then uh, she was taking citalopram for depression and then Norco as needed for pain. For her social history, she really doesn't get out a whole lot. Her, her idea of a good time is uh, raiding the gas station and then going home and sitting, sitting, watching TV, eating some Eggos. She's monogamous, no travel history, and also no tobacco, alcohol, or drug use. Uh, for, for her current presentation this time, her vitals were notable for tachycardia at 121. Everything, was, everything else was, was pretty unremarkable. Uh, but her, for her physical exam, she just did not look well. Um, she was tachycardic. Her lung sounds were kind of junky, raunchous sounds all throughout. She was contradicting herself. She'd sometimes give some answers and other times not. And, and, and the consistency of her answers was, was um, none. She, she'd totally, completely contradict herself with this, this severe cognitive delay. She also looked a little diaphoretic, was, was clammy, and then there's this strange swelling in her arms. Um, uh, both arms are just a little more swollen, uh, extending up to the elbows. Uh, there were point of care labs that were, that were ordered on her. Uh, glucose of 183, uh, pH of 746. Uh, notably on her electrolytes point of care, she had a little bit of a low sodium at 126. Uh, troponin was uh, negative. And then her EKG here, um, sinus tachycardia, a little bit of nonspecific T wave flattening. And uh, then I got a, a PA and a lateral x ray, which uh, the radiology report for this was uh, essentially normal. Just radiology speak for this, this looks all, it's all right. Uh, and, uh, initial labs that were sent out on her, a notable for a thrombocytopenia of 42. And interestingly enough, that was very much new from four days earlier. Uh, her BMP was sent out. Again, she was a little bit hyponatremic. Chloride was also a little bit low. Um, maybe a little bit worse than normal before. And then for her LFTs, um, her, she had a pretty significant transaminitis that was also new when compared with previous. And bilirubin was also uptrending when compared with four days earlier. Your analysis was performed, a little bit of pyuria, uh, some blood and leukocyte esterase uh, contaminated with some squamous cells. A couple additional labs on her, CHF peptide was negative, lactic of only two, uh, PT INR, INR a little bit up at 1.5. Tylenol and digoxin were negative and a D-dimer of 122,000. SCT head was ordered, that was essentially normal, just redemonstrated carry malformation. And a CTPE was also ordered with an abdomen and pelvis. There was no PE, a little bit of splenomegaly, uh, bilateral renal cysts, severe arthritis, and some nonspecific lymphadenopathy, and previous total hip arthroplasties.
And then lastly, CK was 4,500, fibrinogen of 76, haptoglobin of 256, an LDH of 1,800, and then a diagnostic test was ordered. So we've all been locked up for the last few months because of the pandemic, and we couldn't go to concerts and sporting events and restaurants. So I want to give you all the ticket to my event, and I'm hoping that I can fill some of the void left by those cancellations from the other events. And today we're going to go over three main things. I want you all to have fun, and I want to give you some insight into how I approach a diagnostically challenging case. And I want you all to just take a little piece of me with you after today. So what would any national lecture be without any disclosures? And I have no conflicts of interest and no financial disclosures, but I just want to take a moment to give a shout out to my wife. I mean, 2020 has been a mess. And without her, I don't know how we would have kept the family afloat. Literally, I think right this moment, if it wasn't for her, I'd be wearing a button up shirt, a jacket and sweatpants for this presentation. So thanks again. And the pandemic hasn't been all bad for me. I, because of the uh, lost hours, I did get to spend a little bit more time with these three beautiful, lovely little ladies. These are my daughters and they're my reason for everything. But in March, I was living a nightmare. My stress was through the roof. I was irritable and fatigued all the time. Gyms were closed and I was gaining weight rapidly. I had these persistent headaches and these songs played over and over in my head all day long. And I'm not even talking about COVID. I'm talking about Disney Plus. If I have to watch Frozen one more time, I think I'm going to lose it. But it wasn't all Frozen. And I did get to binge watch some of my favorite movies, like all three Godfathers. And I'm just going to say it right now. The Godfather trilogy is the greatest cinematic series of all time. And if anybody says Lord of the Rings or something else, I'm sorry, but we just can't be friends. And just like Michael Corleone and The Godfather 1, we feel pressure. When, when we're presenting at these CPCs, especially on a national level. Now, this is my fifth CPC in just over a year, and I started out 0-2, and, and I feel like I needed a miracle to be here. Now, hopefully, I can perform just as well as Godfather does when the Oscar season rolls around. But seriously, I think I, I, I took my, my lessons from the intern class when they were present, uh, performing for uh, in-service. You know, they say that you don't want to do too well because then you have to keep that level of performance up on the additional in-services. So, you know, so that was the same approach I had initially. It was, it was hard not to embarrass myself because the attendings at my shop have a lot of national lectures and, and uh, multiple presentations. So this year I took a clinical educator fellowship with uh, Anand Swaminathan, who's the course director, and he gives this great lecture on presentations. And in it, he says that every time a presenter or a speaker uh, uh, has a lot of words on the slide or a lot of bullet points, a kitten dies. So needless to say, a lot of kittens were harmed during my first bad presentations, but I promise no kittens were harmed for this one. And just like Michael Corleone and Godfather 3, the pandemic pushed all the conferences around and a lot of cancellations. So I thought it was off the hook. And then September rolled around, I get that email from Tina. And just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. So let's go through the case. I mean, we know we have a 36 year old female. She's brought in by friends and she's not acting right. We're told she complained of fever, shortness of breath and headache at some point. And four days earlier, she was in the ER and diagnosed with a URI. We're given her past medical history, arthritis, cardiomyopathy, depression and Chiari malformation. And her vitals are, are abnormal. I mean, most of them are normal except we're told that she's tachycardic. On exam, we're told that she's sick appearing. She has roncorous breath sounds. She's tachycardic. She's confused but non-focal, and she has non-pitting edema of the upper extremities. Now, medical school tells us that when we hear hoofbeats, we should think of horses and not zebras. But I'm not envisioning a horse coming through that door right now. So when I feel under pressure, when I feel under the gun, I like to ask myself a few questions. And the first question is, how risky is the patient? And my next is, what is my gestalt telling me? How sure am I that I know what's going on? Now, first glance, this is a 36-year-old female, so she may not seem that risky. But again, we're told she's sick appearing, so something is going on, and it's just our job to figure out what that something is. And as far as my next question, I, don't, I have no idea what's going on in this case. So these are the type of cases where I typically would shotgun approach. You know, I'd order a bunch of tests until I figured out what's going on. So we get some point of care testing 
and that gives us a normal blood glucose, pregnancy test, BBG lights, and we see that she's hyponatremic, which can cause confusion, but again, can, uh, hyponatremia is not a diagnosis. So we move on to the EKG, and she has sinus tachycardia with no signs of ischemia. We get a two-view chest x-ray, and we're told that that's normal as well. Next, we move on to labs, and we see she's acutely thrombocytopenic, and four days ago, it was normal. As far as her electrolytes are abnormal today, and four days ago, again, they were normal. Her LFTs are deranged. She has a transaminitis and an elevated t bile, and four days ago, they were normal. And her coagulation panel is completely out of whack. Her INR is off, fibrinogen, haptoglobin, LDH, D-dimer. These are all abnormal. We get some additional labs and we're told that her CK is up. And her urine shows large blood and leukesterase. She does have a lot of squamous epithelial cells, uh, some red cells and some white cells as well. So next we move on to the donut to truth and it gives us some images. We get a CT head, which again shows a Chiari malformation, but no acute process. And because she's short of breath and tachycardic, we get a CT angio of the chest. And because we have no idea what's going on, what the heck, why not throw in the abdomen and pelvis too? So we don't see a PE. We do find splenomegaly, which is interesting. And otherwise, there are a lot of other nonspecific findings. So it doesn't give us the whole truth in this case. All right, so I'm not going to lie. It wasn't just the godfather. I did manage to binge watch The Hangover. And Ken Jeong is, he's amazing. He's a, a stand-up comedian. He's a famous actor. And he's actually a real-life internist. So just like Ken Jeong, when I have a case where I don't know what's going on, I actually like to take a step back and just ask myself, what's the punchline? In this case, we have a young female. She's altered. She complained of fever and headache and shortness of breath. In the ER, she is acutely thrombocytopenic. She has deranged electrolytes, deranged LFTs, and an abnormal coagulation panel. So I asked myself, is this an uncommon presentation of a, un uncommon or of a common disease, or is this a common presentation of an uncommon disease? Is this like Sonny Corleone's illegitimate son, Vincent, taking over the family business in Godfather 3? Still not quite sure yet. Or is it COVID? We're in the middle of a pandemic. Everything is COVID. I think it's like the syphilis of our generation. Some attendings like to use a mnemonic like AEIOU tips, but I actually find it harder to remember it, what the heck the mnemonic stands for. So I like to take a systems approach. And in this situation, start with the primary CNS system. Could she have had a traumatic uh, head bleed or a spontaneous head bleed? Could she have hydrocephalus? Or maybe she has malignancy. Maybe she's got a metastatic or primary process. But I think the CAT scan would have picked up on those things. So I think it's safe to rule those out. Maybe she had a seizure and she's in a prolonged postictal state. But the clinical scenario is not really giving us that information. So I don't know how we'd jump to that conclusion. What about psych? I mean, we're told she, she has a history of depression and she's on citalopram. I mean, could she have had an acute psychotic break? That doesn't explain where the coagulation panel and electrolyte abnormalities and thrombocytopenia fit in. Now, could this be something metabolic? We're given up front that her glucose is normal and she's hyponatremic, but hyponatremia is not a diagnosis. Is this hyperthyroidism? She is tachycardic and delirious or altered. But again, hyperthyroid wouldn't explain the coagulation panel. Now, what about rhabdo? I mean, we're given an elevated CK and an abnormal UA, and there are case reports of rhabdomyolysis causing uh, seizures and altered mental status in, in, in severe cases. But our CK is not really that high, and again, that doesn't explain the rest of the lab abnormalities. Could this be something infectious? I mean, could she have meningitis? I mean, we're given a headache, fever, and altered mental status, but she has no white count, and she's actually afebrile in the ER. There's also no mention of meningismus. And I don't know how the coagulation panel would fit quite yet still. Could this be something tox related? I mean, the list of medications that can cause altered mental status are endless. Could she have overdosed on Tylenol? She has deranged LFTs. We are given a, a normal Tylenol level. I mean, she's she's she has a history of depression. Maybe she's on lithium. Maybe she has bipolar. And we know that lithium overdose can cause hyponatremia. But based on the story, I don't think we can make that conclusion. So just like Peter Clemenza wants to leave the gun and take the cannolis, 
I actually want to leave all those other systems and just focus on the acute causes of thrombocytopenia. And that gives us HIT, HELP, ITP, TTP, and DIC. And today, I'm going to settle all the family business and I'm going to go through these cases. So could this be heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? It does have an abnormal INR, but if we look at the rest of the coagulation panel, it doesn't quite fit. And the clinical scenario is completely off. I mean, we'd expect somebody who's admitted on the hospital on a heparin drip, and that doesn't fit our patient. So I think we could eliminate heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Let's move on to HELP. I mean, HELP does have some coagulation abnormalities which fit, but not all of them. And again, the clinical scenario is off. I mean, we'd expect a pregnant female who's preeclamptic in her third trimester, and our patient is not pregnant, and she had a tubal ligation. So we can eliminate HELP syndrome. What about ITP? We're told she was started on oral antibiotics, and lots of medications can trigger ITP. When we look at the coagulation panel, it, it does not match whatsoever. So I think we could eliminate ITP. What about TTP? We know a vast majority of patients with TTP will present with altered mental status, just like our patient. But if we look at the coagulation panel in our case, the coagulation panel does not quite fit. I mean, we have a low fibrinogen level and we know TTP has normal fibrinogen and normal LFTs. So we can eliminate TTP as a potential diagnosis. What about DIC? And when we look at DIC, it actually lines up perfectly with the abnormalities we see in our patient. And we know a small percentage of patients with DIC will present with altered mental status. DIC can cause hepatic dysfunction that we see in our patients. It can cause pulmonary microthrombi, which, which could explain the shortness of breath. And it can cause splenomegaly from hemolysis. And hyponatremia can be caused by adrenal hemorrhage. You can get edema due to damage to the vascular endothelium. Still, some things don't quite fit. I mean, just like Godfather 3 wasn't as good as the first two, and that doesn't quite fit. Something about DIC doesn't quite fit. I mean, maybe the single diagnostic test is a peripheral smear, and I bet it would show schistocytes. But again, DIC is not a diagnosis per se. I mean, it's triggered by something else. And in our patient, you know, we're given an abnormal UA, but again, there's a, a ton of squamous epi, so it'd be very easy for us to anchor ourselves on that. And the chest X-ray is normal too. But there's another place we haven't checked yet. I think as my single diagnostic test, I'm gonna ask for an LP or else. Now, classically, meningococcemia presents exactly like this. I mean, you have a patient who's altered and diagnosed with a URI a couple days earlier, but the classic findings of meningococcemia are absent in this patient. I mean, there's no meningismus, um, there's no rash, and we're typically told that meningi meningococcemia can progress rapidly over hours, and our patients here for days with these symptoms. There's one other thing that could maybe indistinguishable from meningococcemia. Those are rickettsial diseases like RMSF. I mean, RMSF, again, I know what you're thinking. There's no tick bite, there's no rash, there's no history of outdoor activity, but you actually don't need any of those things for RMSF. And the classic rash that we would find may not present till day five or six, which is when our patient presented to the ER. And classically, RMSF starts with a rash or some abnormalities on the upper extremities and wrists and then progresses, which is kind of what we're seeing in this picture. And the hyponatremia is caused by elevation in ADH and not adrenal hemorrhage, so we wouldn't see that on a CAT scan. The only thing is, RMSF is diagnosed by a PCR, which might not be available in the ER, but a lumbar puncture may help distinguish between the two, and I think we would likely treat for both conditions if we had a high index of suspicion. But if I'm wrong, ASAP, I just want you all to know that you broke my heart. And if I'm right, I'd be happy to repay the favor when I'm called upon. Thank you all. Well, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, so for our patient, the diagnostic test of choice was actually a ferritin. It came back significantly elevated at 13,000. And our demon demogorgon diagnosis uh, that this patient was experiencing was actually called macrophage activation syndrome, also known as hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. So I'm really sorry to have to break your heart, but I thought you did an excellent, excellent discussion. So kind of sitting back and thinking like, what, 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 what on earth, what, what type of zebra is it that this patient came in here with? 
It's actually just a generalized process of immune system overactivation. Uh, it can be life-threatening for sure. Uh, often it can present very variable, very nonspecific. And in general, what happens is there's this theory of what's called a cytokine soup uh, that, that gets put in with a bunch of macrophages that become activated, causing rampant activation. Uh, a lot of inflammatory markers have been implicated in this, including TNF-alpha, interferon gamma, as well as a bunch of interleukons or interleukins. Um, for, for, for classic, typical uh, macrophage activation syndrome, there's actually a couple different groups. There's a genetic group. There's also um, a spontaneous group that typically more happens with children. And then if it happens in relation with systemic juvenile arthritis, then it's actually called the macrophage activation syndrome. That's a specific sub subtype. According to a bunch of different rheumatology textbooks, there's only been about 100 case reports published of this, though it's also thought to be uh, underreported just because it can prevent so variably and uh, uh, look like very many different types of things. So there's, there's some sort of a preceding viral illness that uh, then causes a little bit of the mac macrophages to become activated, who then continually uh, produce a lot of the uh, cytokines that happen, or cy cytokines uh, in the patient's body. There's also loss of inhibitory factors, uh, which leads to this continual process of immune system activation that can cause generalized tissue damage, and as it progresses, can also uh, develop into multi-system organ failure. And one of the diagnostic criteria is an elevated ferritin, which comes from the, these macrophages. So again, it's, it's, it's sometimes you're looking at it, the patient comes in and you're thinking, what is this? What, what, what is going on? It's very nonspecific findings, nonspecific criteria. Um, but in general, a couple of things that you can look for are fever, malaise, and splenomegaly. Um, it can also mimic sepsis or a JIA flare and also look like DIC. Um, but the key findings are this low platelet le level, low fibrinogen, as well as a high ferritin level. Uh, a couple different distinguishing criteria. If you're thinking about maybe this is a JIA flare versus uh, something like macrophage activation syndrome, the fever course can, can be an indicator. Not that this patient would have been able to tell us anything, uh, at least in this, in this case, a continual constant fever is more indicative of macrophage activation syndrome. Whereas a JIA flare uh, can have a waxing and a waning uh, fever course. Um, organomegaly, splenomegaly tends to be worse with macrophage activation syndrome. But again, often in the emergency department, we're not gonna know a patient's baseline for what their spleen feels like on palpation for physical exam. Um, other things for headache and confusion and altered mental status, JIA flares do not present with mental, uh, with uh, neurological findings or any sort of altered mental status. That's much more, much more common with uh, macrophage activation syndrome. So there have been a bunch of different uh, committees and groups in uh, super high specialty fields that have gotten together and, and, and continually revised classification criteria for this. But for macrophage activation syndrome and people with a history of JIA, or, um, they said that you need any two of, uh, in, in addition to a fever, as well as an elevated ferritin, any two of thrombocytopenia, an AST greater than 48, uh, a low fibrinogen below 360, and also triglycerides uh, can, can be uh, uh, decreased as well. So this patient came in um, uh, several years ago, just, just before, well, no, I should say a long time before the, the whole COVID pandemic. But as uh, COVID has evolved and as things have, have progressed with this, it's been very interesting to look at this patient's case and macrophage activation syndrome. And then think about some of the complications that have uh, come about with COVID. Because some of the, some of the things are, are very much interlinked and they have a lot of overlapping features. So one of the complications with COVID is multi-system inflammatory response, which also has elevated inflammatory markers. Uh, the CDC says that you can have elevated ESR, CRP, and procalcitonin with multi-system inflammatory response. And that you can also have elevated 
by Brennigan, D-dimer, ferritin, and LDH levels. And the theory behind this is that there's this same type of generalized immune overactivation from some sort of a, a process. You have some sort of a viral illness that starts immune system activation. Then you get loss of inhibitory factors, and that creates this whole cascade of events of immune system overactivity causing generalized tissue damage. Depending on which tissues get damaged, then causes the presentation for the patient that you're seeing. So again, to treat this demon demogorgon diagnosis for this patient that's coming into the emergency department, you have no clue what's going on. Uh, because the underlying key is that the immune system has become overly activated, the treatment for this is to stop that process you know, with immunosuppressants. Uh, you can give steroids, uh, cyclosporine A, etoposide, or antithymocyte globulin are all uh, different types of treatments that have been reported. In addition, they've also looked at uh, targeting uh, specific interleukin, um, specific interleukins uh, to try and, and treat the process for the patients as well, uh, with interleukin-1 being one of the more commonly reported ones. So for our patient, I'll have to admit, I would love to say that we went ahead and we diagnosed this in the emergency department. All of the laboratory values that you saw were ordered from the emergency department. The only thing that was missing was that ferritin level. As a, but our patient had a history of JIA. She had a preceding viral illness. She, she had, reportedly had a fever. Again, she's afebrile in the emergency department. Um, but she was definitely confused. And she had this thrombocytopenia, transaminitis, low fibrinogen, and splenomegaly. The only missing lab value was a ferritin. So this is certainly a zebra of a, of a, of a case, a zebra diagnosis and something that, again, reportedly less than 100 cases have presented. But it's also becoming more common. This process of immune system overactivation is certainly more common with COVID being rampant right now. It can, it, this, this can be very easily missed and very potentially life-threatening if it goes untreated. And it is diagnosable in the emergency department. So it's something to definitely consider if you have a patient in front of you that's not fitting sepsis or TTP or ITP or an arthritic flare. It's something to just think about. Maybe I should just go ahead and add on that, uh, that ferritin level. Because if you do and you diagnose it in the emergency department, you will look like a rock star to your admitting hospital list. Um, so for our patient, uh, at this point, she was presumptively treated for urosepsis. Um, it, well, she was admitted, and, and then they were pre presumptively treating her for, for potential sepsis, DIC, TTP, excuse me, TTP. Again, a, a couple other lab values that uh, the admitting team ordered. She had an elevated procalcitonin at 10, um, mildly elevated ESR and a CRP. Two days later, she had a rheumatology consult where the ferritin was ordered and the diagnosed macrophage activation syndrome. Uh, she was treated with etoposide and dexamethasone. Uh, she actually developed a hemolytic anemia. Uh, uh, got two transfusions or two, two units of PRBCs and then made a full recovery and was discharged 12 days later. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Sally Mandachek. I am a third year emergency medicine resident at Naval Medical Center Portsmouth in Portsmouth, Virginia. I'm honored today to present to you my case, Too Fast, Too Furious. So let's get started. Okay, so in triage, your nurse calls you and they say that they have a 32 day old infant who you can hear in the background. The chief complaint is increased fussiness. You get a snapshot of their birth history and find out they were born at 35 and six weeks at about five pounds, seven ounces. They did spend four days in the NICU and they received their hep B shot. The vital signs are as shown below. I'll give you a moment to review those. Okay. So moving on. You walk into the room and you see mom and dad with a very fussy, thin male infant who appears inconsolable. His airway is definitely intact. Um, and although he's breathing quickly, you don't notice any retractions. He's got some metric breath sounds. He is tachycardic, but the rhythm is regular, and you notice strong pulses bilaterally. He's moving all of his extremities. There's no evidence of trauma, and he feels kind of moist to you when you touch his skin. 
Overall, this child looks like he's down several espressos, to be honest. So then we turn to mom and dad, and we have a chat about what brought them in today. You find out from mom and dad that for the past two weeks, he's actually been fussy, but it's been intermittent. However, in the past two days, it's been nonstop. He hasn't been sleeping, he's been spitting up more after feeds, and overall, he's been more irritable. Thankfully, they haven't noticed any fevers. You talk to them a little more, and you actually come up with a timeline of all of these symptoms. So as aforementioned, he was born at about five pounds, seven ounces. He did spend some time in the NICU, four days for fetal tachycardia and meconium. He had a little bit of respiratory depression when he was born and required four minutes of positive pressure ventilation. Thankfully, his sepsis negative was work, his sepsis workup was negative, so he was able to be discharged to follow up with his pediatrician. On day 16, when he followed up with his pediatrician, his weight was about six pounds. Although this was um, more than his birth weight, the parents were instructed to fortify formula and come in for a weight recheck in approximately a week, which they did on day 23. At that time, he was about six pounds, six ounces, but the parents said that he was feeding well and stooling and voiding appropriately. They had no concerns at that time. That brings you to day 32, which is when we saw him in the ER. At that point, he was was inconsolable. He was about six pounds, 13 ounces, so it only gained about seven ounces. He had an elevated heart rate, elevated respiratory rate, and he just looked jittery. You can see day 19 and day 27 there. These are calls that the parents made to the pediatrician with various concerns, constipation, how to bathe the child, um, concerns that maybe there was a hair in his eye, um, that maybe his hair was falling out spontaneously while he was crying. All right. So after you get an HPI, you go ahead and do your review of systems. You notice that for the most part, they're negative. He did, and the parents noticed as well, he did have moist, warm skin, and he was irritable, hyperactive, and not sleeping. Other than that, there was no fever or recent illness. There was no rashing, bruises, or skin change. He didn't have any draining ears. Um, he wasn't mouth breathing. They denied any, feeding with, uh, denied any fatigue with feeding. There was no cyanosis, no wheezing, no cough. Although they did say that he had some changes in bowel habits with formula change um, initially, those were now resolved. And there was no vomiting, diarrhea, or change in appetite. His GU and MSK review of systems were unremarkable. So we go ahead and move on to past medical history. As we mentioned, he was born preterm at 35 and six. A C-section was required for arrested descent. He stayed in NICU for those four days, as we talked about, and needed that positive pressure ventilation for lack of respiratory effort but his septic workup was negative. He's not on any medications. He has no allergies. He did have a circumcision, but it was uncomplicated. And he lives at home with his mom, his dad, no pets and no siblings. So we move on to the physical exam. The vital signs are shown as above. He appeared distressed and he had a lack of subcutaneous fat. You also notice he had a really prominent stare but there were no corneal abrasions on the fluorescein stain. He had a fast heart rate with a strong rhythm. He was breathing quickly, but his lung fields were clear bilaterally. His GU exam was soft, non-distended, and the liver margin was in normal limits for his age. He was warm and moist and had a delayed cap refill, but there was no rash or bruising. Additionally, he was alert uh, with, with exaggerated moral reflex, excuse me, and um, was jittery. His GU and MSK exams were normal. This is our patient. And this is his eyes, a picture of his eyes. So we gave him a fluid bolus and maintenance was started. An EKG was obtained, which just showed tachycardia. The abdominal x-rays were obtained, which were unremarkable. Then we moved on to newborn screening, obtained from his records and labs, which were as follows. I'll go ahead and show you his newborn screen results. And then I'll show you his labs and give you a moment to review those. So a diagnostic test was ordered. Okay, good morning. My name is Danielle Turin. I'm the Associate Program Director of the Emergency Medicine Residency at Zucker School of Medicine Northwell, and that's in Long Island and Queens, New York. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Manichak for her presentation. Uh, I also want to thank her for making me think of Paul Walker in the morning, too fast, too furious. It's going to be a good morning. Um, so I wanted to start by changing gears. Um, 
the presentation she gave made me want to pump the brakes. I'm afraid we're about to crash. So I think um, we need to slow this whole thing down. So reviewing the presentation she gave us about the triage, we have a 32 day old male preemie that presented in triage. So I've been doing this now for about five years and <laughs> still to this day, uh, when I see a young baby like that uh, on the track board, my heart rate just shoots up just like the speedometer on a car. Um, and then my eyes really start to pop out and um, as it would be, I probably look like our patient today um, when I see the heart rate of 190 and the respiratory rate of 68. Um, so now I'm really kind of getting nervous. Uh, the baby's described as distressed, fussy, inconsolable. So I, I really want to change gears on this whole thing and slow it down. So let's start at the starting line. Um, Dr. Manischek said the parents came in complaining that the baby had been fussy over two days or two weeks, worse than the last two days. The baby's described as not sleeping, which let's face it, that's probably pretty typical for a newborn. However, the baby is spitting up more after feeds and having no fever. Uh, the past medical that she reviewed uh, revealed a preterm uh, neonate born by C-section with a short NICU stay that sounded like it was relatively unremarkable, minimal respiratory support, a negative sepsis workup, um, nothing else too revealing. So the things that I kind of focused in on from the initial presentation was that this baby is fussy and it's spitting up after feeds. So at this point, I kind of want to shift gears. I'm gathering information, but at the same time, I'm actively generating a differential. So the things that stood out were the fussy baby differential as well as the baby that's vomiting after feeds. So the fussy baby differential is something that is very vast. Um, you know, it could be something so simple from like a hair tourniquet, corneal abrasion, something you're going to easily see on your physical exam, something like gas or colic, which is really our diagnosis of exclusion, um, to some more severe things like intussusception or fissures, incarcerated hernias, SVT. Um, a lot of these things, fortunately, we're going to be able to find on our physical exam or through our investigation. Um, so I'm hoping that we'll get some more clarity on that as we proceed through the case. Um, additionally, things like infectious causes, hopefully, again, with labs and our, our physical exam of the patient, that'll become more clear to us. Um, certainly with a fussy baby, we always want to consider a non-accidental trauma, uh, as well as failure to thrive, um, which based on our presentation, certainly there are some indicators for that. Um, and then the baby that's vomiting after feeds, we want to consider things like pyloric stenosis, intussusception. Maybe the parents, these sound like new and inexperienced parents, maybe they're just feeding inappropriate volumes. Um, or maybe this is something simple like GERD. I'm, I'm really hoping for simple. So I think we need to investigate further. So we were provided a very detailed um, history as far as weight gain and, and how things had kind of progressed over the first four weeks of this baby's life. So if we kind of delve into that and examine that in a little bit more detail, this baby was born at about 2,500 grams. Uh, two weeks old, they had gained about 150 grams and were instructed to add more formula. Three weeks, another 160 grams on top of that. At this point, noted to be feeding, stooling, and voiding well. And four weeks old, today, the day of presentation, they gained another 200 grams. It sounded like this was punctuated by some phone calls. You know, the question that pops up for me are these typical new parent questions versus is there something going on at home? Should this be pulling our attention in to the more like not an accidental trauma, abuse, neglect um, kind of situation? So when we're looking at the weight gain for this baby specifically, I think the failure to thrive differential really kind of has to take the forefront which coincidentally falls under our fussy baby differential as well. So this baby was born at about 5.8 pounds, 2,500 grams, um, which puts this baby on the low end of the growth curve. That's about the fifth percentile if you look at the WHO growth curve. Um, and then at the one month mark, which is today, we're at about six pounds, 13 ounces. Um, and that actually drops the baby off the growth curve. So we're at the less than second percentile. So that is meeting our, differ our, our diagnosis of failure to thrive. Um, so what causes failure to thrive? So we kind of have to delve into those things to see you know, what's going on exactly with this baby that we're seeing today. Could this be a chromosomal abnormality, um, an endocrine abnormality, a metabolic disorder? You know, we would hope that those things would be identified on our newborn screening exam. Could this be a cardiovascular problem? 
Um, does this baby have congenital heart disease that was undiagnosed? Is there an arrhythmia or something like that? Is this a malabsorptive issue? Um, there was some commentary about this baby having some vomiting as well as some issues with stooling. Um, you know, are they diluting down the formula? Uh, there's so many things that could be going on with a failure to thrive in the fussy baby differential. Um, so these two things kind of open up a multitude of possibilities. Again, feeding, latching, swallowing difficulties might be useful to watch this baby feed. Um, is this a, going back to the economic, emotional, parental withdrawal, non-accidental trauma, uh, abuse kind of thing? So again, I think we need to pop back in and hope that we can get some more clarity. Um, as I said before, we've generated a very long list of differentials and it almost seems like the road ahead of us is getting more cloudy than clear. So I'm hoping that in reviewing carefully the review of systems and the physical exam, we'll get some more clarity, figure out where it is exactly that we're going. Pardon. So um, review of systems, the baby was noted to have no fever and no sick contacts. So I'm thinking less likely infectious. Mom was noted not to be taking meds. I found this very interesting. Um, you know, not often do we find out about the parents in the review of systems. So I'm wondering, um, should this be some sort of indicator to us that mom is healthy, has no medical conditions? Um, it doesn't seem like she's breastfeeding. They did comment, comment that she was formula feeding. If she were breastfeeding, could it be an issue with something she's taking being passed through to baby? Um, should we take away from this that that means mom doesn't have any substance abuse history, you know, maybe, but we know that our patients don't always tell us the truth. Um, so that was something that kind of uh, clicked for me as I was reviewing the review of systems. Cardiac wise, noted to have no fatigue with feeds or no cyanosis. So that's kind of leading me away from that congenital heart disease, uh, cardiac issue with the baby. Um, respiratory, the baby was noted to have no cough, but was noted to be breathing quickly. I found that to be interesting because the work of breathing was normal. There were no retractions, the baby wasn't coughing. Um, so it's seeming less like a respiratory issue or an infectious issue or a ventilatory issue. However, what could be driving that respiratory rate? Um, is this something metabolic that's driving the respiratory rate? Is this something CNS that's driving the respiratory rate? Um, that's definitely something I want to hold on to. And then as far as the GI, it seemed like those issues had been present, constipation, which is kind of funny for a new baby, um, but that seems to be resolved. They actually said no vomiting or diarrhea recently, so I'm kind of steering more away from the malabsorptive GI into susception, those kind of uh, pyloric stenosis issues at this point. The neuro exam, the baby was noted to be irritable, hyperactive, and not sleeping. Um, so I've had a newborn before. Certainly they can be irritable, and certainly you feel like they're never sleeping, but hyperactive is kind of a strange one to describe a four-week-old as. So again, that's something that stands out to me that I want to hold on to as I proceed. So I feel like we're getting somewhere. We're kind of able to start putting some things in the more and the less likely categories. So now if we own in on the physical exam, um, the vital signs, Blood pressure unable to obtain. I don't really make too much of that. Often um, neonates of this age, it's routine at my shop for them to not obtain a blood pressure unless I beg and plead. Um, but I do wanna check in on the heart rate. That is elevated. The respiratory rate is certainly elevated. However, the baby is satting well and is afebrile. Um, so some of the things that would normally, to me, drive a high heart rate and a high respiratory rate, like a fever, are kind of crossed off our list. I'm hoping this is a rectal temperature. I'll just assume that it is. Um, and then the other elements of the physical exam that draw concern are this is a distressed baby. Um, I never want to hear that when I'm looking at a 30 or a, a four week old infant. Um, this baby is lacking sub Q fat. Um, there's proptosis, which is a very interesting thing to know in a baby. Whenever I hear proptosis, I'm usually thinking thyroid abnormalities. Um, we crossed off our corneal abrasions based on this physical exam. The baby was tachycardic with strong pulses, no cyanosis or modeling. Again, the, the congenital heart stuff is less likely based on that exam. Um, tachypnic but clear, no increased work of breathing. Again, that tachypnea is pulling me in. The belly soft, non-distended. Um, the liver was slightly enlarged. I think three, three and a half is about upper, upper limits of normal, um, but certainly not a peritoneal abdomen, not an abdomen that's drawing in my attention as to the, the target, the source of everything going on might be in the belly. Um, the GU exam was marked as normal, so less likely a torsion or hernia situation. The skin is warm, diaphoretic, no rashes or bruises. So warm I like, 
diaphoretic certainly perplexes me. Um, again, having had a neonate and examined neonates, usually they're kind of scaly, red, rashy little things. They're usually not wet and sweaty. Um, so that's, again, pulling in my attention. No rashes or bruises, um, making me feel a little better about the um, non-accidental trauma differential. Um, I'm hoping that's not the case. Um, alert, symmetric, exaggerated, moral, and jittery. So as I'm hoping to narrow my differential, I actually, based on this physical, have popped up an additional category of the jittery baby differential. Um, so a jittery baby, what could that be? Um, electrolyte abnormalities certainly pop up, the, the sugar, the calcium, the magnesium, thyroid stuff pops up under this category as well as hypothermia. Um, we can already kind of knock that out because we have a temp on this baby, this baby is normothermic. Neonatal abstinence syndrome can certainly cause jitteriness. Um, I know they did comment that mom wasn't taking any medications, but as I said before, you know, most of our parents aren't going to be forthcoming to us, um, especially in the setting of a substance abuse issue. So certainly we need to consider that. Sepsis is still a consideration. Um, vitamin D deficiency kind of pops up in this category as well. Vitamin D deficiency can cause hypocalcemia, can cause seizures, uh, can cause irritability, but usually lethargy. And this baby didn't seem lethargic. It seemed more active, distressed, and like on caffeine, as Dr. Manischek men mentioned to us. Um, and then we want to consider, of course, seizures, neurological disorders. And then again, at the very bottom, the benign jitteriness of a newborn, which goes into our wastebasket of diagnosis of exclusion. So I've caught maybe a jittery baby, maybe just a fussy baby, a barfing baby, um, and maybe a baby that's just failing to thrive. And at this point, I feel like, which way am I going? Where do I go? I feel like my head might explode. Um, so I'm going to look to these labs. I'm relying on my nursing pit crew who, you know, lined lab and sent everything for the baby. Um, and when we review what was done for the baby, the baby was given fluids and they didn't have a change in heart rate, um, which is a little bit concerning to me. It kind of points away from a dehydration issue. There's something driving tachycardia that's not related to volume status. Um, the EKG was sinus tach, so we can cross off that SVT from earlier uh, that fell under our fussy baby differential. At least we can cross it off in this moment or these six seconds that that EKG took to snap. Um, they had a belly x-ray that was unremarkable, so no signs of obstruction, um, making that less likely like an intussusception. Um, however, I would prefer an ultrasound, but I'll take what I can get. The labs look normal, so that crosses off a bunch of our electrolyte disturbances that we were considering before. And then we have this newborn screening exam, which um, I don't, most of you are probably like me, as emergency physicians, we rarely see this exam. Um, I feel super happy that the column with the, uh, the values all says normal, um, but you know, what's in a newborn screening exam? Um, you've got the fatty acid disorder, some uh, chromosomal things, um, immunological disorders. It's a screening test. It varies by state. Um, so depending where this baby is born, there are certain things that may be included that in other states wouldn't be included. But again, I'm mostly gonna feel happy that it says normal. So here we are. It's all becoming more clear, sort of. Um, all roads lead to somewhere. So I think on the left side of the list, the fussy baby, gas colic stuff, and, and the vomiting GERD stuff, you know, I think we can kind of leave those. Um, because let's be honest, if that's what was going on with this baby, probably I wouldn't be here today. So I think we're pushed now more over to the failure to thrive jittery baby differential. Um, and based on what we reviewed so far, uh, I think we can still say some of these are less likely, like the cardiovascular problem or the chromosomal and metabolic disorders that hopefully were screened out with our newborn screening test. Um, the hypocalcemia and hypomeg, unfortunately, I didn't see those in the lab, so those kind of still sit there. Vitamin D, hyperthyroid, and some of the neurologic disorders and seizures still sit there. So at this point, you know, I think that I'm going to own in and call what I see. We've got a premature baby with warm, moist skin that's irritable and hyperactive, restless, poor sleeping, tachycardic with bounding pulses, not gaining weight well even though they're taking PO, with maybe a little bit of a big liver and a characteristic stick. So I'm going to call this neonatal Graves disease, and the test that I would like to order is a free T4. Um, if I'm really greedy, I'd like the whole thyroid panel, uh, but I think I'll go with the free T4. Thank you.
All right, so the diagnostic test that was ordered was a TSH and a reflex T3. Okay. The TSH was almost undetectable and the T3 was through the roof. This places our diagnosis as neonatal thyrotoxicosis. Before I dive into the depths of this diagnosis, I wanna go back to the ER to finish up the case. So once the lab results returned, the patient was started on weight-based Esmolol and PICU was called for disposition. Once the patient arrived at the PICU, cardiology and endocrinology were consulted and the patient was started on oral weight-based methimazole. As symptoms started to improve, Esmolol was able to be weaned off and the patient was able to be transferred and transitioned to the wards and eventually discharged to follow up with pediatrics and endocrinology. So let's have a look at what happened when they left the hospital. So outpatient follow-up with pediatrics, the repeat thyroid testing was normal. They were off their medications and gaining weight appropriately, and they'll actually be followed by endocrinology until six months of age. So let's talk a little bit about neonatal hyperthyroidism. It affects about one in 50,000 neonates, which puts its incidence level on par with something like Wilson's disease or hereditary angioedema. Another interesting point about neonatal hyperthyroidism is unlike adult hyperthyroidism, which has a female preponderance of five to one, neonatal hyperthyroidism affects boys and girls, neonates, equally. The number one cause is maternal Graves' disease. However, very interestingly, only one to 5% of babies born to moms with maternal Graves' disease actually develop neonatal hyperthyroidism. So the question I asked is why isn't this 100%? And to answer that question, we need to review the pathogenesis. So let's go ahead and do that now. So the pathogenesis of neonatal hyperthyroidism all starts with the mother. In the mother's bloodstream are antibodies specific to the TSH receptor of the thyroid cells. Some of these antibodies are stimulatory as shown in blue, and some are inhibitory as shown in red. Additionally, they have different relative potencies as shown in the differences in their size. Regardless, all of these antibodies travel through the maternal bloodstream to cross the placental barrier and make their way to the fetus. Once in the fetus, they find the thyroid cell and the stimulatory antibodies act on a G protein coupled receptor. This ultimately upregulates the amount of T4 and T3 in the bloodstream. So we can answer a question now of why only one to 5% <coughs> excuse me, of neonates born to moms with maternal Graves' disease actually develop hyperthyroidism. And the answer is due to the ratio of both stimulatory and inhibitory antibodies, as well as their relative potencies. Okay, so now let's go ahead and review some of the clinical features of neonatal hyperthyroidism. Interestingly enough, many of them mirror adult clinical features. This is helpful to us. There are a couple of marked differences as Dr. Turin so astutely pointed out. These include preterm birth, low birth weight, failure to thrive and difficulties feeding, irritability, moist skin, and also that really prominent stare, which is secondary to lid retraction due to sympathetic overdrive. So if we go ahead and look at our patient, we can kind of put all of those together, aside from obviously the jitteriness and the hyperactivity, which we can't capture in a photograph. All right. So how did we arrive at this diagnosis? As Dr. Turin expertly pointed out, a lot of what we didn't see was equally important to what we did see. If we look at the history, we saw that the child was born preterm with a low birth weight, but they failed to gain weight even after they were born small. In fact, they completely fell off their growth curve. Anytime an infant completely falls off its growth curve, to us, it hints that there's something systemic and severe underlying occurring. They also had excessive irritability and not sleeping at all. On presentation, although the patient had pertinent positives of being jittery, tachycardic, tachypnic, thin, more moist skin and proptotic, there are a lot of things that we did that were not positive and important in anchoring on this different, in anchoring on this diagnosis. Working from head to toe, the fluorescein stain was negative for corneal abrasion. Although they were tachycardic, there weren't very many other signs of heart failure. The EKG was normal, the liver edge was a little large, but still within normal limits for the child's uh, age. There were no rashes, bruises, and we didn't see a fever. On workup, 
Abdominal x-rays were negative. Our labs were markedly negative. EKG showed sinus tachycardia, even on repeat. Also importantly, the neonatal screening was normal. We'll get into why that's important for our ER uh, course in just a moment. This all pushed us to obtain a TSH and a high T3, a TSH and a T3. When those labs came back, this cinched our diagnosis. So let's talk about why this is relevant to us in the emergency room. Overall, this represents a classic presentation of a rare diagnosis that occupies one small corner of the vast umbrella that is the fussy infant. A common mnemonic used to work up the fussy infant in the ER is the it cries mnemonic. The differentials for this are expansive, so I won't go through the entire list, but you can notice um, in the photograph that I've included that thyroid is not in this mnemonic. So we can now expand that mnemonic to include hyperthyroidism for our fussy infant. Additionally, as Dr. Turin so expertly uh, pointed out, reviewing the growth chart was critical in this case. This infant completely fell off their growth chart. The severe systemic underlying disease is suspected in that case. Also, as astutely pointed out, what does our screening lab include? Neither neonatal nor prenatal screening labs routinely universally include thyroid. It's at the discretion of the provider and it varies by state. Having a normal neonatal screen in this case didn't take off hyperthyroidism as something in our differential diagnosis. This case also finally allowed us to, to review the ED management of thyrotoxicosis, which mirrors that of adult thyrotoxicosis, with the important exception that we use methimazole instead of PTU for its safety effect and side effect profile in pediatric patients. So overall points to anchor on before we go. Neonatal hyperthyroidism is a rare life-threatening cause um, and manifestation of the fussy infant. The ICRIS mnemonic should be expanded to include this differential. And finally, growth curves are critical in evaluating the fussy infant in the ER. I wanna thank you for your time. Um, because I have a little bit of time left, I also want to tell you why this case is one of my very favorite cases that I've encountered. Um, and the reason is through the careful care and evaluation of this infant, we were able to reverse engineer, screen the mom and test her. And she was found to have undiagnosed and untreated maternal, undiagnosed and untreated Graves disease, maternal Graves disease, obviously when she was pregnant, but Graves disease. She's now on treatment and both mom and baby are doing really well. Um, I also, because I have a little bit of time, this is actually a picture of me, and this is my now three-month-old son, Simon, uh, who was seven weeks old at the time. Uh, so this case was especially relevant to me this year um, as a new mom. All right, thank you very much for your time. I enjoyed presenting this case to you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of these presentations. Take care. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Karen. I am a second year emergency medicine and physician scientist training resident uh, at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. And the title of my talk is Time and Space. Hopefully a few of you get the reference. So it is skipping. There we go. Um, it's skipping the chief complaint slide, but the chief complaint is uh, I have a new cough. Uh, I don't feel well, I have nausea and vomiting, and I have new thrush. I don't know why it's skipping that slide, but I do apologize. So the history of present illness for this patient is she's 46 years old, and she's coming to us with these symptoms during April of 2020, which, as I'm sure you all uh, well remember, is kind of the big start to COVID, at least for us here in the central part of the United States. And she has had a productive cough and shortness of breath, uh, for about three days, and it's been getting worse. She recently started oral fluconazole for thrush, but she hasn't gotten any better. And she recently finished a course of Augmentin for acute sinusitis, but she's still having pain. And this woman has taken COVID very seriously. She's self-isolating. She's got no sick contact. She hasn't traveled. She's immunized. And before I even get to the point where we're talking about admission versus going home, she tells me straight up, she's like, Doctor, I hate going to the hospital and I wanna go home, so don't admit me. Well, that made my eyebrows raise up. Uh, so past medical history, it's also skipping um, review of systems, I apologize. Uh, she has a history of breast cancer, though it is in remission. Uh, 
Uh, she's got a history of IgA vasculitis and fibromyalgia. Cardiac-wise, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. She's got a little bit of depression and anxiety, a little bit of GERD, and some type 2 diabetes. For surgical history, she, uh, for her breast cancer, had a left mastectomy in 2015 and some minor surgeries uh, otherwise. For social history, she is an active smoker and she's been smoking for 25 years, drinks a little bit, married with one child, very interestingly trained as a botanist but works as a substitute teacher. However, due to COVID, she is not working at all. She is self-isolating at home. Family history-wise, uh, both her mother and her father have autoimmune diseases, though she doesn't know about the autoimmune disease in her mother. Uh, there's also a history of breast cancer and melanoma. And medications-wise, she's on quite a few. Uh, mycophenolate, prednisone, hydroxychloroquine, uh, other things for her past medical history as listed here. Allergies-wise, she has a few of them, though she hasn't come in contact with any of these medications in the recent past. Physical exam-wise, I have her triage vitals here at the top. She's afebrile, heart rate's in the 90s, blood pressure looks good, saturating 98% on room air at rest. But I walked in that room, and this woman, she was sweaty. Uh, she looked very uncomfortable. Uh, because of her history of acute sinusitis, uh, I looked in her ears, and her ears actually looked quite good, and her history of thrush, I looked in her mouth, and indeed she did have thrush quite active uh, with white plaques everywhere in the oropharynx. Cardiovascularly for me, she was tachycardic on exam, and respiratory-wise, her breathing was labored. She had inspiratory and expiratory wheezing, worse on the right, but her left lung was clear. Um, and again, her skin, she was diaphoretic. Lab results, so even though the patient did not want to stay in the hospital, she did not allow us to place an IV. She didn't want any blood work. And so what we did get on her was a respiratory pathogen panel, which was negative. And though this says it's testing for coronavirus here, this is of course the uh, pre-COVID coronavirus test. So this was not a COVID test. Uh, this patient actually at our hospital in April did not meet criteria for testing uh, for COVID and we did a walking desaturation on her to help stratify admission versus going home, and she desaturated to 88% while walking. This is her chest X-ray uh, that we got, and I will point out that radiology read over here on her left chest as her breast implant from reconstruction. I'll let you take a look at that. So she's like, Doc, I'll just come back if I get worse. And obviously this wouldn't be a CPC case if she didn't get worse. So she goes home and the next day she comes back to the emergency department worse, worsening shortness of breath, tachycardia. We start her on antibiotics and she is admitted. So she tested negative for COVID at that time and there's the rest of her blood work. And then on that next day, she comes in with a new rash. So here's a close-up of a piece of her rash, and the question prompt I'd like to leave you with is what medication should be started immediately? Thank you very much. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Franny Rudolph from UCSD, and I named this CPC faculty discussion a cough in the time of COVID, because like Karen mentioned, this is right at the beginning of COVID, where it was really hard to expand our differential of a cough and shortness of breath past COVID. So this really made me go back into the archives and think about all the other things that are gonna be on our differential for this presentation. So done, 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 it's April, 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic and a 46 year old female comes in with this cough. Also these kind of other infectious virally symptoms of vomiting, sore throat. She's on fluconazole for thrush and she recently had some sinusitis and finished some antibiotics and she has persistent facial pain. So her review of systems was pretty unremarkable. So no fevers or chills, none of those other B symptoms like weight loss. Um, she doesn't have any congestion. And at this point she has no rash. Her medical history is interesting. It really covers all the major bases. So she's got an oncologic history with this breast cancer in remission. 
she has this rheumatologic history, this IgA vasculitis, which is interesting, usually more in children. She has some cardiac history with hypertension and she has diabetes. So those are the big things. Her social history is interesting. So she's trained as a botanist and she's a smoker, um, but she is a substitute teacher. So it's very clear that she's not working, not having COVID exposures. And she's got this strong family history of autoimmune diseases, which could be important. So rheumatoid and some other autoimmune disease. And her, her medication list is very interesting. What I take away from this is that she is significantly immunocompromised. So she's on mycophenolate, daily prednisone, hydroxychloroquine. So either this is for the IgA vasculitis, which would be interesting because that's usually self-limited, or she forgot to tell us about a kidney transplant. But it's a pretty interesting medication list here. And then she's got some allergy, fluconazole, fluticasone, she's on NSAIDs. But really what I take away from this is that she is significantly immunocompromised. So her exam, she looks distressed and we're told that she's got diffuse inspiratory, expiratory wheeze on the right, but that the left is clear. We're basically told that she has evidence of thrush here, but I'm not told if she has any sinus tenderness, lymphadenopathy, um, she's tachycardic. I'd be interested if she had a murmur and her vital signs are pretty, pretty unremarkable on her initial visit. Let me click forward. All right, so no labs on the first visit. She does desaturate, so we know she's got some pretty extensive involvement there. She doesn't get a COVID test, gets a negative respiratory viral panel. And then she has this either breast implant or possible left lower lobe infiltrate on her chest X-ray. Otherwise, I don't see any large consolidations, maybe a little bit of patchiness here in the right, but nothing else too large that I see there. So she decides she wants to leave and I'm like, wait, I have questions. I have so many questions. Why is she on all these immunosuppressive meds? What is this IgA vasculitis history? You know, normally it's in kids, HSP, self-limited, only 10% in adults. And did she get antibiotics when she got home or did we just AMA or not give her anything? But luckily she comes in the next day and I'm like, well, that, that escalated quickly. She's got worsening shortness of breath. She's tachycardic, she's given community acquired pneumonia, antibiotics, and she's admitted. So I wasn't told which antibiotics she was given, but presumably the normal community acquired pneumonia antibiotics. This time she does get a negative COVID test that's along with her initial respiratory viral panel and the Legionella test, we know that her influenza, chlamydia, mycoplasma is, uh, is also negative. She has this elevated ferritin. So that's going to show us evidence of inflammation, um, acute phase reactant there. She has this hemolyzed LDH and AST. So I'm not sure if that means that it's abnormal or like my lab, things just hemolyze all the time. And then on her CBC, she has a neutrophil predominance, a little bit of lymphopenia. And importantly, I think for my differential, she has no eosinophilia. So you're about to just tell her, I told you so, you'd be back, pass her off to the medicine team and admit her. And she pulls up her shirt and she's like, doctor, look at this rash here. So she's got a maculopapular rash with a little necrotic center here. So a papulonecrotic rash. And I am tasked with deciding what medication should be started immediately. So my approach to cases like this, when I get a lot of kind of nonspecific information, is to really look at everything and try to pick out the details that are important through the whole HPI review systems. So let's start with this woman. She's significantly immunocompromised. She does have a oncologic history with a breast cancer history. She's got some room history. She, over one to two weeks, develops thrush, sinusitis, some kind of infectious symptoms with this cough. Then she has this chest x-ray with a possible infiltrate there. And she has a rash and elevated ferritin. So inflammatory markers are elevated. And so I could start with her uh, radiology read of her chest x-ray, left lower lobe consolidation, maybe Bertold, it, it could be 
her breast implant, this differential would be bacterial, viral, fungal pneumonia, malignancy, autoimmune, blah, 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 correlate clinically. But truly, that kind of is the differential for this woman. So we have an infiltrate respiratory symptoms in an immunocompromised woman. So it's pretty broad. So she has over here some infectious etiologies. And we'll just start going through. I'm going to say, though, she could have something like a pseudomonas pneumonia, which classically you can have ecthema, gangrenosum, a rash associated with that. I think it's a CPC, and it's probably not just a disseminated bacterial pneumonia. I'm going to take this at face value that it's not mycoplasma, legionella, chlamydia, things that I was told were negative, including viral. So could this be zoster, and she has a zoster pneumonia? Pretty rare, but I'm going to leave it on there. Um, CMV, like I said, hopefully she doesn't have a secret kidney transplant she didn't tell us about. Also, I would expect this to be more bilateral. Sometimes this has erythema multiforme associated with it, but you need to be very significantly immunocompromised, usually in organ transplant recipients. And could this be mycobacterium TB or non-TB? Um, I would expect that to be more of a large upper lobe infiltrate and more granulomatous skin findings. And also, there's not just one medication I would start. So I'm going to leave that off the differential. So next, could this be a malignancy? Could this be a mass or a lymphoma or some cryptogenic organizing pneumonia? Certainly, she has risk factors for that, um, but I don't think the chest x-ray findings are very classic. And again, there's not really one medication to start for that, so I'm going to take those off the differential as well. So over here, I have my fungal and more of my rare immunocompromised pneumonia diagnoses. And without initially knowing where this case was from, it was hard to pick between these. So could it be histo, coxy? Luckily, now I know, you know, the this wouldn't be classic for Iowa. Could this be mucor, which would be very severe, usually associated with hemoptysis. Candida, again, severely, severely immunocompromised. Um, aspergillus, interesting, though I would expect to have some eosinophilia. And could this be sporotrichosis? I just put that on there because of her, that's the Rose Gardner's disease, and I'm told she's a botanist, so that'd be fun, but I doubt that it's that. So I'm going to take off those two because she has no eosinophilia. PJP, that would be interesting in an immunocompromised patient. Though the chest x-ray, I would expect to see more of a patchy, hyler appearance with that bat wing appearance. So I'm going to take that off. And here we have our more rheumatologic diagnoses at the bottom. So granulomatosis with polyangitis, formerly Wagner's disease. There, I would expect her to have some renal involvement, some of that necrotizing nephropathy we're told about. Churg Strauss, that's usually a chronic asthma like sinusitis. Um, again, I would expect eosinophilia with that, though I'm going to leave those on the differential because they, would they could present with the rash and some pulmonary findings. Um, lupus, you know, first of all, it's never lupus, but she'd also probably have malar rash, um, some other joint findings there. Sarcoid as well can have some chest x-ray findings, some skin findings, though again, this would be more of a bilateral hyalur adenopathy, so I'm going to take that out. Could it just be a flare of her IgA vasculitis? Not really sure how that manifests for her, um, possibly. And could this be drug-induced? She's on multiple medications. Um, I don't think so. As far as her medication list, nothing is classic for there. Maybe methotrexate can cause some pneumonitis and some skin findings, but she's not on that, so I'm going to leave that off. And then, of course, it's 2020, so it's probably still COVID, but I'm told she's really self-isolating and her test is negative, so I'm just going to take that as it is and say it's not COVID. So the next piece of information that we have is this rash. And and here are the diagnoses that are left over. And after I submitted this case, I sent this rash to my former med school roommate, now a successful dermatologist, and said, what do you think? And she said, quote, I don't know, get a punch biopsy. So it's a pretty nonspecific rash. And I think that all the things that are left on my main differential really could fall into play here. So could this be a varicella, zoster, pneumonia with these early skin findings. It's not exactly classic for that. Could it be one of these fungal 
infections with a dissemination and a rash, or could it be a more rheumatologic vasculitidy? So let's break it down here. So for VZV pneumonia, some things that argue for it is she's very immunocompromised. She started with some viral symptoms. Um, the chest x-ray appearance is atypical. I would expect it to be bilateral and the pneumonia preceded the rash. And normally with VZV, the rash is gonna precede the pneumonia if you do develop the pneumonia. So of course the medication here, it would be a cyclovir that I'd wanna start. Could this be a disseminated fungal infection? Well, she is immunocompromised, so she's at risk, and she had some sinusitis, thrush, facial pain, some other fungal infections, so that could be pointing in that direction. Though she had no eosinophilia on her lab, so it wouldn't be something like aspergillus, and it was a relatively rapid onset, so some of these fungal infections are more of an indolent course, and we would expect some fever or something else like that to precede in those B symptoms. And the medication I would start here would be an antifungal like itraconazole. Or could this be a vasculitis flare? She's got a history of this IgA vasculitis. We're not really sure how that manifests. She's got a very strong family history of rheumatologic diseases. Though I think some things that don't exactly support that is she has normal renal function. So it's unlikely to be Wagner's with that necrotizing glomerulonephritis. IgA vasculitis, you'd expect more of that palpable purpura rash, um, erythema nodosum, something like that. And so the rash isn't exactly typical for that. And she also had these infectious symptoms that preceded it. So it sounded a little more infectious to me. And here you'd of course wanna start some sort of steroids. So the, those I think are the three choices and it was really hard to choose. And in real life, I'd get a chest CT cultures, including sputum and AFB. I'd get a biopsy of the rash and I would cover her for PJP. But this is a CPC, I can't do that. So step one in 2020 is pick any other diagnosis over COVID and that was a struggle for me, but we made it through then. Step two was to avoid choosing steroids when anything happens to the skin. So I'm gonna go kind of out on a limb here based on the rash and say that possibly it could be the VZV pneumonia and the drug that I would want to start right now would be a cyclovir. All right, Dr. Rudolph, I must applaud you. Uh, that was a fantastic presentation. Uh, and so disseminated in time and space is uh, the second half of my presentation. So to answer the question prompt that I had of what medication should be started immediately, I think the, the key to this, at least in my opinion, was to identify that rash. So after this patient got admitted, as uh, Dr. Rudolph did, dermatology got consulted, and they dropped a note um, that I might have needed to open a dictionary in order to interpret, and essentially numerous vesicated something something, serosanguinous crusting, the faint pink background uh, all over the body. Uh, and so, uh, dang it, okay. Let's try this. Aha. Essentially, I think what they were getting at was uh, dew drops on a rose petal appearance, not that they decided to say that, and they recommended getting a zonk smear. And that zonk smear was positive for multinucleated uh, keratinocytes, exhibiting et cetera, et cetera, again, outside of my purview. And they recommended sending a PCR to further evaluate what this rash is, except it's COVID. And the hospital is putting all PCR resources aside only for COVID. And so now this rash identification becomes a week long send out. Now we did not do a punch biopsy, certainly not in the ED, and that did not happen on the floor either. But this patient, based on the presentation of the rash, was immediately placed on airborne precautions and empirically treated with IV acyclovir. Well done, Dr. Rudolph. And PCR eventually returns positive for, you got it, disseminated varicella zoster, uh, zoster pneumonia. And so this patient, uh, she had quite the course. When she was admitted uh, hospital day four, she got transferred from internal medicine to the MICU and they stopped prednisone cold. And then she had a worsening oxygen requirement, uh, got placed on OptiFlow at 40 liters. By day seven, she was able to be transitioned back down to five and then uh, started on valet cyclovir 
down to one liter by hospital day 12. And by hospital day 14, she was discharged on half of her original dose of prednisone. So pneumonia in the severely immunocompromised, uh, the way that I broke this down uh, for my personal learning was trying to figure out uh, what kind of immunocompromised this patient was. Uh, and so quick, quick background, uh, immunology, you've got kind of two main branches of your uh, immune system. You've got your humoral immune system and your cell mediated. Uh, and if your humoral immune system is going to be antibodies, uh, and so some people are going to be at a deficiency because of a hematologic malignancy, some of them are because of HIV, um, and that's because of actually a decrease in CD4 uh, cells, so you're not getting your T helper cell response. People might be losing antibodies, such as in nephrotic syndrome. They might not be making antibodies, such as in congenital things, or they might be uh, having their cells destroyed, such as by chemotherapy. For cell-mediated immunodeficiency, which is more the case for our patient, uh, people who are on immunosuppression for organ transplant, which she did not have, but I agree, this girl was on quite a lot of immunosuppressants, uh, but she did have a very hard to control rheumatologic disease. And so, for humoral deficiency, again, antibodies, we're looking at epitopes on the outside of cells, we're looking at B cells producing antibodies, producing plasma cells for killing. But for the cell mediated, oh, excuse me, for humoral deficiency, what you're going to see is more of a bacteremia type presentation, recurrent sinus or pulmonary infections, and our patient did have uh, recurrent acute sinusitis. But you also might see things like meningitis, um, especially with children presenting with this, and encapsulated bacterial infections. But for cell mediated immunodeficiency, which was our patient, um, what we're looking at is uh, not enough T cells. Uh, so we have an inability to recognize intracellular pathogens specifically such as viruses um, and so our cells we cannot produce our helper T cell response in order to further along uh, other cell types killing and then we also lose our direct CD8 positive killer T cell response of killing of infected cells so uh, for our patient, the intracellular pathogens were definitely uh, higher up on her differential. Things like, as Dr. Rudolph pointed out, uh, mycobacteria, pneumocystis, yeast histoplasma, other fungus, and especially HSV, VZV, and CMV. And this is just electron microscopy of some uh, virions getting ready to be released. So pneumonia in an immunocompromised person and other symptoms really help narrow down the differential. And if we have an immunocompromised patient with pneumonia and a hematologic malignancy, tuberculosis becomes higher on your differential. If they have a solid organ transplant, a fungus becomes higher on your differential. So PCP pneumonia uh, often has a co-infection, can't click that, with CMV and chronic glucocorticoids, and our patient was on that, but she did not have a solid organ transplant. And what you'll see for that is severe respiratory failure without radiographic signs sometimes for PCP. Also, uh, aspergillus is high on her differential, uh, but that will colonize prior injury. She did have a breast implant, but I don't think that would qualify. And then cryptococcus uh, for a solid organ transplant with pneumonia uh, concern for that is going to the brain and causing meningitis, but you might see nodules uh, on imaging. And if a fungus especially is on your differential for an immunocompromised person with pneumonia, a stat chest CT is rather helpful in further differentiating. Our patient did get a CTA while inpatient to evol evaluate for pulmonary embolism, which she did not have, um, but she did have uh, ground glass opacities, patchy parenchymal involvement, both lungs, even though the x-ray only really showed one lung pretty well, lung nodules consistent with infections. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rudolph, when you brought up that slide with radiology, I laughed so hard because this is exactly what they posted for this one. Um, and then she also had some secretions in her right lower lobe concerning for aspiration. Um, but that was uh, less important, I think, than the infectious signs seen on that CTA later. <laughs> 
So what about immunocompromised pneumonia and a stem cell transplant? CMV is going to be your big baddie there with bilateral symmetrical lower lobe involvement. And then again, co-infections with PCP or aspergillus. Um, in the winter and the fall, regardless of an immunocompromised state, but especially for those patients, most likely we're looking at influenza. And then in the spring and summer, most likely we're looking at adenovirus. Now, pneumonia and rash, uh, which is the big thing that our patient presented with, the big two are going to be HSV and BZV. And essentially, it cannot be differentiated on exam. You have to send PCR in order to figure out which is which, which is why I didn't ask the question necessarily, what was the diagnosis, but what is the treatment? Because the treatment would be the same. And our patient did admit to a history of chickenpox, I think, as most patients her age would. And the concern for the disseminated VZV is that it can go to the liver, the brain, the lungs. Uh, it can be seen in the larynx. Um, so it can be all over the body. Um, our patient did not receive a scope uh, on the floor, though she did have thrush, but she was treated for thrush and the IVA cyclovir. So dew drops uh, on rose petal appearance, um, at least per our dermatology evaluation. So our final case outcome for this patient uh, one month later, she comes back with very similar symptoms. And it turns out, poor girl, she has a severe adenovirus infection. She's hospitalized for 25 days for that. So that's getting more into the uh, full summer. And at that time, her hydroxychloroquine is completely stopped. And then later on, she developed severe dysphagia, lost 35 pounds, and then developed refeeding syndrome it was admitted with an aspiration pneumonia also for the better part of a month. At that time, nephrology stopped her mycophenolate. So she was eventually discharged only on eight milligrams of prednisone daily, down from the original 20, which she is likely to need indefinitely for her IgA vasculitis, which for her was very difficult to control. So certainly for her and for many patients like her, uh, a, a seesaw trying to find the balance between uh, being immunocompromised and uh, controlling a rheumatologic process. So disseminated in time and space, BZB pneumonia. Well done, Dr. Rudolph. Thank you very much. Okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Taylor Conrad. I am one of the EMI residents at SUNY Downstate Kings County Hospital here in Brooklyn. Uh, so thank you for uh, allowing me to present at the CPC finals here, and uh, thank you to Dr. Sankoff, who's going to be discussing with us, uh, and we'll go ahead and get started. So for our presentation, uh, we have a 46-year-old woman. She presented to the emergency department, actually really primarily in the fast track area, uh, with a, a complaint of tender areas to her thighs, on both sides in her lower extremities, for about a week. Uh, she has a past medical history of diabetes, a self-stated history of some heart failure, as well as an unspecified psychiatric diagnosis, uh, prior history of polysubstance abuse, which includes uh, methadone maintenance, as well as a history of anemia, but no prior transfusions, and it's kind of unclear of what her baseline hemoglobin is at. Uh, so primarily, she presented with these lumps, uh, some areas uh, that were some bruising, various areas of ecchymosis to her bilateral lower extremities. Some areas, she said, were a little bit more swollen, uh, while others just looked darker and bruising. Uh, she denied any specific history of any trauma uh, to these areas or really any trauma at all, as well as no neurological problems. She denies any numbness, tingling, uh, weakness, no difficulty with gait, was able to ambulate, ambulate to the ER as well. Primarily, one of the other main things that drove her to the emergency department was this worsening fatigue and these constitutional symptoms, which she really best described uh, as if her anemia had worsened. Uh, she does take a daily aspirin, and we'll go through her med list in a second as well. She does also note that in addition to all of this, she has been trying to uh, treat herself a little bit with taking frozen baking soda daily in order to address her anemia problem. Other than that history, uh, she really only denies as part of the review of systems, no specific uh, bleeding sequela, no hematuria, no evidence of GI bleeding or mucosal bleeding as well. So to kind of summarize the review of systems, really it's mostly just this positive for these constitutional symptoms of weakness, insomnia, fatigue, some subjective weight loss, although nothing uh, very specific, as well as the easy bruising and uh, lesions down from petechiae up to ecchymosis. And the rest of the reviews of systems is pretty unremarkable. 
On her history, uh, her, her medications were very consistent with the past medical history that she stated. Uh, she is on the daily methadone program and does take aspirin. Otherwise, she denies any prior surgeries. She does smoke a little less than a packet per day for many years, she stated. Uh, no specific travel or other drug use, just the, the methadone program that she's been consistent with. She also denies, importantly, no family history of any bleeding disorders or autoimmune diseases. On physical exam, she's actually generally uh, well appearing with relatively normal vital signs, as mentioned here, uh, but she does appear a little bit older than stated age. Uh, in terms of the rest of the physical exam, it's relatively unremarkable, uh, at least from the provider's point of view, except for primarily the lower extremities, as well as on the skin exam, which is notable for multiple large ecchymoses to her right and left leg, primarily in the upper inner thigh, uh, as well as some small swelling and ecchymoses around the knee area on the left. Uh, and she does have some petechial uh, areas that are pre predominantly on the most distal part, uh, on the shins and legs. Uh, and some of these lesions are a little bit raised and palpable. An EKG was done in the emergency department because of her weakness, presented here. And the labs that were done, as you look in the top left, her comprehensive panel was uh, relatively unremarkable except for a creatinine of 1.8, h which we don't know the baseline, but no acidosis or hyperkalemia. Her CBC on the top right was notable for uh, hemoglobin of 6.8 with an unclear baseline, but no leukocytosis or thrombocytopenia. Her liver function panel is noted here with total protein of 5.6, albumin 3.3, AST and ALT uh, within the normal limits of 11 and 6, Alcoholic to 59 and total billy of 1.2. A BBG, uh, which is done in the bottom left here, and COAG panel with INR 1.3 and PT PGT respectively. Some other labs were done as well, such as uh, all of the uh, autoimmune workup that we talked about here, ANA, antiphospholipid. She also had a Coombs antibody, which was negative, and hepatitis C serology is just negative. HIV is negative with the, auto, the uh, hemolytic labs on the right. And a sphere that was really just a varied RBC morphologies, nothing specific, and an iron panel was done. Lastly, an imaging of a CTA of the abdomen and lower extremities was performed to rule out any major bleeding, given the law of the ecchymosis that you saw, which showed no active arterial bleeding or retroperitoneal hemorrhage, but did have areas consistent with the hematomas noted on the lower extremities, suspicious for venous bleeding. And with that, a test in the ER was sent that revealed the diagnosis, and I'll leave it over to my colleague, Dr. Sankoff. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks, Dr. Conrad. That was a really great presentation of a very difficult and interesting case. Uh, my name is Jeff Sankoff. I am a faculty at the uh, Denver Health uh, Residency in Emergency Medicine, and I'm glad to be here in October, a month that I really enjoy, as you can tell from the uh, background here. Fall is uh, an exciting time for me, not just because it's the CPC finals, uh, but also because I'm a big fan of the fall foliage. We're very lucky here in Colorado to have all the aspen trees with the gold and yellow leaves. Unfortunately, this fall has been a little more fiery than we usually like. Where I'm originally from, though, is Montreal, where we have uh, a much brighter palette of colors. Uh, our colors in Montreal range into the reds and oranges, and it's really quite spectacular. If you ever get a chance to get up there and take a look at it, it's quite amazing. Uh, it harkens back to an interesting story, though, that I think has a little bit of a tie into this case. About 500 years ago, the French explorer Jacques Cartier first traveled across the ocean in search of a Northwest Passage. And at that time, he made two separate trips. The first of them was to explore the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And on the second trip, he made his way all the way down the St. Lawrence as far as his ship could go to the Lachine Rapids, where he came across a native village called Hochelaga, which would later become the site of Montreal. At that time, his men uh, were really sick, and he attributed it to the climate, which, as you know, in Montreal later becomes Quebec, uh, not all that pleasant, very cold, and he turned to the natives in hopes of finding a solution to try and uh, help his men. The natives did indeed have a solution. They told Cartier if he could find uh, this tree, the eastern white cedar, and take its boughs and boil it in water to make a tea, that he would be able to return the constitution of his men. And uh, I believe that that tea actually bears uh, some resemblance or at least has some tie into this case. And let's just discuss the case that Dr. Conrad has given us today because it's an interesting one and I 
dare say, quite confusing and, and difficult. We have a 46-year-old lady who presents to the emergency department with lumps on both of her legs for a week, and she's had increasing fatigue in the setting of anemia that uh, she believes is getting worse. Now, to treat this anemia, she's taking large amounts of baking soda, not the way I would manage such a problem, but you know, to each their own. Uh, on review systems, she complains of easy bruising and petechiae, and her exam is essentially normal with the exception of the skin exam, which is really where we're gonna concentrate most of our attention, because here she has multiple large ecchymosis to her legs, she has small swelling and ecchymosis to the knee, as well as petechiae on both of her legs, several of which are raised and palpable. And on her laboratory exams, we see several other important abnormalities, including the fact that her anemia is quite profound. Her hemoglobin is 6.8. She has a mild uh, acute kidney insufficiency. We're not told if this is new, but it is there. 1.8 is not normal. Uh, she has a borderline, but still within normal range, INR of 1.3. She has significant alkalosis, which is to be expected given the fact that she's taking so much baking soda. Her uh, pH on the VBG is 7.5. And interestingly, in the setting of her anemia, she has no signs of hemolysis. She has normal but borderline low iron studies. Her autoimmune studies are all negative, And the CT scan shows us that she has venous hematomas in her upper legs. So in constructing a differential diagnosis for this patient, I see before me a patient who's presented with a bleeding diathesis. And if I wanna come up with a differential diagnosis, I need to go all the way back to medical school and think about the clotting cascade. I need to consider both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, as well as the common pathway, where both of these pathways uh, join, in order to come up with a differential diagnosis, because diseases that will impact any of these pathways are going to be responsible for causing a bleeding diathesis such as we see in this patient. And that doesn't necessarily mean we need to remember all of these factors, but it does mean we're gonna need to explain what is going on in these pathways. And we can do that by coming up with a list of possible disease processes. So for example, it's very possible that the disease that's affecting this patient is causing a factor deficiency. And there are a number of things that can do that. There are inherited possibilities such as hemophilias, or alternatively, patients can have acquired factor deficiencies such as with medications, such as warfarin or the novel oral anticoagulants. There are other ways to get acquired factor deficiencies, and this can be because the liver is just not synthesizing them as much, such as with acquired liver disease, or when the gut biome is affected and we're not producing as much vitamin K. And consequently, we have uh, malabsorption of vitamin K and decreased synthesis of the vitamin K factors. If the factors are all in normal amounts, it's then possible that we have a problem in the common pathway below the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. And in this case, there may be an abnormality in platelet function. Sometimes platelets are consumed, such as we see with TTP or hemolytic uremic syndrome. Sometimes platelets are just not produced in adequate amounts. We can see this in chronic diseases, such as alcoholism, or in acute processes, such as infection. And then there may be normal numbers of platelets, but the platelets just aren't working properly because the patient is taking a medication that is inhibiting their function. Now, sometimes factors are normal, sometimes platelets are normal, but the platelets just can't adhere to one another because there's an absence of von Willebrand factor. And again, von Willebrand factor de deficiency can be either inherited or acquired and the acquired form of von Willebrand is most commonly seen in hypothyroidism. Finally, if all of factors, platelets, and von Willebrand factor are normal, there are vascular processes. And again, vascular processes can be either acquired or inherited. Congenital problems such as Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or acquired processes such as henlock scheinlein perker So how are we gonna get to which of these processes is the cause in our patient? Well, the diagnostic approach to a bleeding diathesis, including in our patient, will always begin with the proper history. Does the patient have any illnesses that are associated with bleeding? Well, in this case, we haven't been told of any. She's not known to have cancer or liver disease. She's not an alcoholic. She doesn't have thyroid disease or end-stage renal failure. So we can rule out all of those processes. Similarly, she's not been on any antibiotics that could inhibit vitamin K function by altering the gut biome. So these are pretty much able, we're able to rule these out.
other medications that might inhibit bleeding or clotting formation that could in, that cause bleeding, well, she is on aspirin. So we're going to have to consider that as a possibility. And so we'll come back to that in a short while. A very important part of the history overall is to really think about the bleeding history itself. How and where is the patient bleeding? Because that can point to a potential culprit on the clotting cascade. For example, is the patient bleeding in their mucosa? This patient is not. Is the patient bleeding into the muscles or joints, as is very frequently seen with factor deficiencies? Here, not so much. She's bleeding in the legs, but it seems to be venous bleeding as opposed to bleeding directly into the muscles. She is, however, bleeding as in the form of petechia and purpura, and this is very commonly seen with platelet dysfunction. So just by virtue of the fact that she has petechia and purpura, we can begin to suspect that our bleeding diathesis is because of a problem in the common pathway at the level of platelet aggregation. Now we combine this with the labs that were given. For example, we know that she has a normal platelet count. We also know that on her coagulation profile, her INR is a little bit elevated, but still within the normal range at 1.3. And her calcium, a critical um, electrolyte for clotting is normal. So at this point, we can rule out a lot of the diagnoses that were on my differential. We can essentially say that factor deficiencies are not an issue here because her PTPTT are normal. Similarly, consumptive platelet processes and inadequate platelet production are also not an issue because her platelets are normal. But because she has petechia and purpura, we know that there must be something going on at the platelet aggregation uh, area of the common pathway. And therefore, we're left with really only three diagnostic possibilities at this point. She can have platelet dysfunction related to the aspirin she's taking. She can have von Willebrand factor deficiency, or she can have some kind of vascular problem. So let's look at each of these in turn. And we'll begin first with platelet dysfunction related to the aspirin that she's taking. Now we don't know that she's overdosed on aspirin, but we have some hints that maybe something's going on. The patient is taking sodium bicarbonate in large amounts, which essentially is the antidote to taking aspirin. So if she was having chronic salicylism, maybe she wouldn't manifest the symptoms of aspirin toxicity because she's taking the antidote at the same time. So she could permanently inhibit all of her platelets, resulting in significant platelet dysfunction and not manifest any of the serious features of aspirin poisoning. We see on her blood gas that she has a PCO2 of 37, which is not as high as I would expect it to be given the very high pH that she has. So is it possible that she's got this, you know, salicylism stimulating her brainstem, causing her to hyperventilate and blow off more PCO2 than she otherwise would given her pH? So in favor of chronic aspirin poisoning in this patient, we have a mild respiratory alkalosis on top of the severe metabolic alkalosis. We have platelet dysfunction that could be causing her bleeding. And we have anemia that we could suppose is from GI bleeding related to an aspirin gastropathy. However, there are a few things going against this. She has no tinnitus, which we might expect to have in chronic salicylism. She has no metabolic acidosis whatsoever, which I really would expect to see if she was having that much aspirin. And platelet dysfunction alone is really not enough to explain the amount of bleeding that she's manifesting, certainly not deep bleeding in the legs. What about von Willebrand factor deficiency? Well, quite simply, this doesn't seem particularly likely. And again, platelets and von Willebrand factor do not explain the level of bleeding that she's showing in the deep tissue. So I think we can rule that one out, which leaves us with vascular disorders. So Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is definitely a possibility in this patient, but doesn't seem quite likely given the lack of any description of other associated symptoms. She doesn't have joint laxity, and it would be very unusual for a patient to show up at 46 years of age with this severity of disease without ever having shown up with anything before. So that leaves us with acquired vascular problems. And the one that came to mind right away is henlock schonlein purpura, HSP which is IgA deposition in the small vessels. And there are several things in favor of this for this patient. She has dependent petechia and purpura. She has normal platelet count and coagulation profile. And she does have mild renal impairment, which if it's acute, could be attributed to HSP. Furthermore, if her anemia is due to GI bleeding, that could go along with this. There are a couple of things going against it though, which help us, I think, rule it out. She has no abdominal pain. She has no joint involvement, both of which are very, very common with adults who have HSP. 
And she has no history of an antecedent infection or anything else that could really explain why she would have this. And lastly, while HSP definitely causes bleeding in the skin that we see in this patient, it does not explain the bleeding that she has deep in the tissues. So at this point, I think we've got to return to our story of Jacques Cartier and the Eastern White Cedar. The reason that the natives told him to use this, although they didn't know it at the time, is because the Eastern White Cedar boughs are extremely high in concentrated vitamin C. It turns out that Cartier's men were not suffering from the cold. They were suffering from scurvy, as so many sailors did at that time. And so I believe that our patient also is suffering from an extreme case of vitamin C deficiency, which has led to her having collagen problems and a vascular issue relating to her bleeding diathesis. In favor of this is the fact that she has bleeding in the setting of a normal platelet count and normal coagulation profile. She also has profound anemia, which we can see not only from bleeding, but also from the fact that when vitamin C is absent, red cell uh, production is affected. It also is the only one of the diagnoses that I've discussed so far that actually explains the bleeding that she has on her CT scan. Now, there is one thing going against this, and that is that we don't really have any history of a nutritional deficit of vitamin C in this patient. But anybody who's going to be consuming that level of bicarbonate kind of wonder if maybe she's just also not taking in other things that she should be. So my diagnosis in this case is scurvy. And the test that I would send is a vitamin C level. And just one more thing. This attractive young lady is my wife, Dr. Sandra Kay, who's a pediatric surgeon here in Denver. But she's also a direct descendant of Jacques Cartier. So <laughs> as in so many other things in this world and in my life, in this case and in my life, I am always indebted to a Cartier. Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you again, Dr. Stankoff. And, uh, and that was a wonderful explanation of the differential diagnosis and thought process going through it. And uh, I'll kind of review the case now and, and see where we land. So just to recap, uh, we have this 46-year-old woman, past medical history of diabetes, some heart failure, psychiatric history, polysubstance abuse, and anemia. Uh, as Dr. Stankoff pointed out, there is this questionable concern for this poor diet given the baking soda. Of course, we can't make that cognitive leap uh, solely based on that, but there might be some underlying issue with it. Uh, she does have these constitutional symptoms of fatigue and malaise, as well as the easy bruising and significant bleeding. Uh, we saw the multiple ecchymoses on her extremities. We saw the petechial lesions, some of which were a little bit palpable, as well as the CTA, which showed a significant amount of the uh, venous bleeding in the deep tissues as well, uh, with no evidence of hemolysis on the labs and no active arterial bleeding. So abnormal bleeding, as Dr. Sankoff went through, uh, which I won't go into the details of, but we, we obviously do have a differential that can uh, break down the different aspects of it. And I believe that he went through it very beautifully. And, and one of the things that I will mention as well is, you know, we can land ourselves in the same aspect as Dr. Sankoff did, that there's this concern uh, that maybe there is a connective tissue issue that may not necessarily be either inherited or uh, related to an autoimmune process. Uh, but it certainly could lead us to the test that was ordered, uh, as Dr. Sankoff mentioned, which was certainly a vitamin C level. And so this patient uh, definitely was diagnosed with scurvy. So thank you. Uh, so we'll go through the hospital course for her. Uh, basically, it was, it was pretty straightforward. She was transfused a, a unit given the hemoglobin being less than seven. She was actually started uh, initially on vitamin C supplementation uh, once she got admitted uh, after cons consultation with a few services, with dermatology and uh, a hematology who felt that that was probably the most likely diagnosis at the time. Uh, and while we waited for the level to come back, which did not come back right away. Um, and of course, uh, her constitutional symptoms did start to improve really within 24 hours uh, and was continued on supplementation after that and discharged in about two days uh, with the diagnosis of vitamin C deficiency. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the diagnosis, uh, which has a long history, uh, as Dr. Uh, Sankoff mentioned, but really it's a, a uh, constellation of these symptoms or a syndrome that can result from low vitamin C levels, resulting in inhibition and improper formation of collagen throughout the body, whether it's in skin, bones, mucous membranes, or in the vasculature, as you mentioned, which can lead to vascular fragility and this type of bleeding. Uh, based on the level and the chronicity of how long the vitamin C can be, can be the different types of presentations that it, that it can present with, and we'll go through some of the details. So uh, as you mentioned, scurvy has a long history. 
Uh, it has definitely been around since we have had written history as well, even being mentioned back in the Epirus Papyrus back in 1500 BC uh, in ancient Greece, as well as probably more popularly known during the seafaring uh, ages, which that was popular in which this was a disease very common uh, for individuals with a poor diet, a diet devoid of many citrus fruits, uh, until a Dr. James Lenz in the 1700s really showed that introduction of citrus through, through lemon really could prevent uh, and cure a lot of the problems that people were seeing back then. Although it did take uh, many decades until after his initial uh, finding of this to really institute a, uh, a change in things. But after that, we started seeing a decline. But then since then, we did start seeing it in various areas of either wars or even in, in the American Civil War uh, or various areas of human conflict in which a poor diet uh, may not be a choice uh, and many individuals can suffer from this. I do want to mention one last historical aspect of it before going into the details uh, of Scurvy a little bit more, which I found very interesting. The Dr. Crandon uh, physician in Boston tried to experimentally determine how vitamin C affected wound healing. Uh, he did this very interestingly. Uh, he developed with a, a group of participants, uh, initially three, uh, included the three on this paper. However, two of them dropped out after uh, not adhering to the diet Dr. Crandon prescribed. Uh, and so he was the lone participant in N of one in this and spent many months on a diet devoid of vitamin C, uh, ultimately developing many of the sequelae of the disease of scurvy. Uh, and finally, after many, many months, did he show that having a self-inflicted wound uh, have poor healing uh, on pathological analysis. And eventually he was treated with vitamin C, got better, and then certainly published this paper. So it, um, Vitamin C deficiency in scurvy certainly has a long history uh, in just humans as well, as well as in our uh, understanding of the disease. So vitamin C has very many roles, uh, primarily when we see the, con the consequences of the deficiencies of vitamin C, it comes from the issues addressed with the hydroxylation and formation of collagen properly. However, it does have other roles, such as the synthesis of various catecholamines, as well as the carnitine process. It is uh, involved in the uptake of iron from the GI tract and has very different immune system function. And so just here, I will mention the, uh, the biochemistry behind it. This is just one of the many reactions vitamin C is involved in, and this is specifically the hydroxylation of proline into hydroxyproline uh, with the requirement of vitamin C, which of course is not uh, made by us. It is made by various different other organisms, but it is required to be uh, intaken by humans as a part of the diet. And so what are some of the more modern causes and why we might see this, uh, even though you know, we don't have many of the uh, seafaring problems that we used to have, we do still have situations and circumstances in which individuals might not have adequate access, uh, either uh, deliberately or uh, not by most often not fault of their own. Uh, this can be seen in individuals who just have a poor diet in general or have substance abuse, alcohol abuse, but also just in general, poverty and poor access, even in uh, developed countries, and especially here in the United States, many of the processed foods and uh, aspects are not necessarily uh, have enough vitamin C in the diet. Uh, also, individuals who are dependent on others, such as the elderly or chronically ill or institutionalized, are certainly at risk for this. And what I mentioned, uh, especially with conflict, uh, one, some of the more common uh, cases we see, especially outbreaks of vitamin C deficiency and scurvy is, are in various refugee cramps, across the world in which individuals certainly don't have adequate access to nutrition. And so and the symptoms of scurvy uh, usually do take a while. Uh, they can take a few months, uh, requiring no intake of vitamin C to see it, but it's primarily, as we see with this patient, constitutional symptoms, some type of bleeding diathesis primarily seen in the lower extremities, and it's this issue with the vascular problem and the collagen uh, production in order to uh, prevent that venous bleeding that occurs that we see the sequela. You also can get types of uh, nail changes as well as hair changes, classically corkscrew hairs, uh, as well as some mood swing psychiatric issues, and as Dr. Crandon mentioned, poor wound healing. And so some of the examples of the uh, purpura petechial lesions that we can see uh, here, you see especially perifollicular petechial lesions, which can be confused, especially sometimes in some autoimmune diseases, uh, because they can have sometimes a raised nature, but really is not a representation of an inflammatory process. It's more representation of just where it is in the perifollicular area that sometimes it gets raised. 
uh, but also we have some other lesions here which they tend to usually not be raised uh, but varying levels of types of bleeding especially perifollicular with the the uh, changes in the hair follicles and so I will just take a moment and mention about purpura. Usually it is associated with something bad. And we, when we recognize it, we usually see that something is wrong, uh, but it can range from small little lesions, such as sepsical lesions up to ecchymosis. And as Dr. Uh, Stankoff mentioned specifically as well, is that we need to think about the coagulation cascade, as well as the effects of the platelets uh, on, in understanding what level of bleeding this is coming from in order to understand where on the pathway we need to look. Uh, there is no one specific presentation of the way the purpura looks that can delineate you towards one thing. Uh, even here uh, in this uh, slide or this uh, graph on the right, you can think about it in some areas where maybe if they look more sick, if it's more palpable, you can get various other things, but there's a lot of overlap in reality uh, of the differentials of these. And it really is a good history and physical that's gonna make the diagnosis. And lastly, we can see some just specific gum chases and some mucosal gum bleeding. And so how do you make the diagnosis? I will just take a moment to mention that, uh, especially with our understanding of the social aspects of emergency medicine things, we are going to oftentimes, especially in our society, see the patients who are at risk. And so we do need to keep this on our differential. It can be a very difficult diagnosis to make, and often it is one that is made after excluding many other possibilities. Uh, but it should be thought of in patients with abnormal bleeding and bruising, especially with constitutional symptoms, uh, the petechial and purpural changes we mentioned, as well as the hair changes, uh, male changes in the extent of the bleeding the patient had. And so uh, in summary, learning points is, as always, a good diagnosis first comes with a very good history and physical. Uh, understanding the differential of atraumatic bleeding and bleeding diapathies is important for making the uh, diagnosis in this case. Understanding the importance of purpura and how scurvy's history has influenced a lot of medicine and our understanding of it and the importance of vitamin C in making the diagnosis. So with that, uh, these are my references and thank you. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever everyone is. I'm Alec Emmerling. I'm one of the fourth year residents at Naval Medical Center San Diego in emergency medicine, of course. Happy to be here today. Sorry it had to be virtually, but better that than not at all. And better that than during a pandemic in New York, I suppose. Uh, with that, I will begin. Uh, so I have nothing to disclose and no other disclaimers other than that these views are that of my own, and not of the Navy's or Department of Defense. So. The chief complaint we're gonna begin with today is weakness. Here's the history. So you're working in the emergency room, you're seeing 16 patients at once, and then suddenly as you see, roll by your front, the doctor's office, the doctor's box, uh, an obese Hispanic 18 year old male. You notice that it took two or three nurses plus the kid's parents to place him from their car into the wheelchair. You go chat with him, you realize he's speaking to you. He describes having diarrhea over the previous few days, but otherwise symptoms which were ignorable. These were all non-bloody. He awoke this morning with mild fatigue and then over the previous handful of hours, relatively rapidly developed more severe fatigue than lower extremity weakness, than weakness in all four extremities. Upon getting to the emergency room, after seeing what you just saw, he also had two episodes of vomiting. The patient tells you, I feel like I literally just can't get up from bed. He continues that he has no suicidal ideation and his parents who are at the bedside describe that he's never attempted suicide before. They don't believe he's inappropriately ingested anything. They say basically their son had very mild diarrhea over the last few days and this morning he just was unable to get out of bed. He says he doesn't wear a mask in spite of the pandemic because his parents do not make them, though he does not go to classes. His review of systems, I already mentioned the upper and lower extremity weakness. I mentioned the nausea and vomiting, which just began today. The diarrhea, which lasted two or three days. He also does, when you go through a very thorough review of systems, he does mention shortness of breath, but he just, when you ask, does it hurt when you breathe or do you feel like you're Breathing more, he says, I just noticed my breathing more is really the full description he gives. No fevers, weight loss, cough, headache, no visual changes, nothing else. His medical history is relatively boring. He has no drug allergies. He has been taking fluoxetine for the last six months, but he stopped that three days ago. 
He does have a history of depression, which is the reason he takes fluoxetine. No past surgical history. You ask the parents to step out of the room and he says no tobacco, drug, or alcohol use. Um, excuse me, he does have social alcohol use, but no other drug or tobacco use. And he is adopted, so he has an unknown family history. Physical exam, vital signs mostly within normal limits, heart rate 79, blood pressure 150s over 70s, normal respiratory rate, oxygen saturation of 99 and a temperature of 97.9. You notice the uh, overweight but normally developed and in mild distress due to vomiting, he's trying to hold onto the emesis basin in one of his hands. His eyes look normal, his heart rate looks, uh, has a regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, rubs or gallops, clear lungs, soft and non-tender abdomen. His neuro exam is really where you start noticing abnormalities. He's fully oriented, he's speaking fluently. All of his cranial nerves, facial muscle movements are seemingly normal. He does, however, have reduced strength in arm extension and flexion. Seems a little stronger in uh, his hands, wrists, and fingers. However, he can't really resist you, for example, when you ask him to lift his arms off the bed. It's even worse at his hips. He can barely activate extending his hips and the same for flexing his hips, though he does have reduced strength, but uh, is stronger at, with dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Normal pulses and his skin is uh, warm, dry without rashes or petechiae. This is his EKG. Give you about 20 seconds for that. Chest X ray. These are the labs. Sorry, I wanna, you'll notice that the only abnormalities are the ones highlighted in red, but the bottom is a drug screen, which was negative. Head CT. And then finally, lumbar puncture. Notice an opening pressure of 44, white counts of 10, reds two, glucose of 71, and protein of 22. So at this point, one more test was ordered and then the diagnosis was made. Thanks very much, Dr. Ammerling, for this uh, case. I think it reinforces the problem solving skills of emergency physicians and their interest in emergency medicine rather than internal medicine. So what I'm gonna do is discuss the salient features of this particular presentation. And I've listed the findings uh, that I found quite remarkable in the presentation of this case. And I've highlighted the ones that I would like to draw our attention to first. One of the things that I think is interesting is the age of this patient in terms of his initial presentation. Uh, we noticed from his recent history that he's had several days of diarrhea and has now had some vomiting in the emergency department. His most remarkable presentation and complaint is the very rapid onset of acute, painless, proximal four extremity muscle weakness. And I think this is one of the most important findings that I'll come back to in terms of discussing potential differential diagnoses. We're told that he has a past medical history of depression and is on fluoxetine, although he has not taken any in the last three days. The physical examination findings are particularly important in this case. The blood pressure is mildly elevated, I would say, especially in a previously uh, healthy young gentleman. We do note by his physical exam that he presents with obesity. The neuro exam, as Dr. Emmeling uh, suggested, is truly the linchpin for this uh, evaluation. The patient has a normal mental status and a normal ocular exam. Uh, his cranial nerve exam is normal, but he has fairly remarkable proximal extremity weakness. Uh, his uh, muscle strength is described as being one to two over five in the proximal muscles and four to five in the distal musculature in all four extremities. He is a reflexic, which is another important fact, and he has a normal sensory examination. In terms of the diagnostic data, the findings that I think are really salient to this case are the EKG, which to my eye demonstrates a normal sinus rhythm with a long QT interval that appears to be approximately at least 
The other findings that are remarkable are a mildly elevated lipase and a mildly elevated CK. Finally, the opening pressure of 44 is elevated, and although there is a correlation between opening pressure and uh, body mass index, I would still consider this to be abnormal in this patient. Given those findings, I'd like to discuss the patient's complaint of weakness. Because weakness is not generalized, it's truly proximal muscle weakness. And there's a wide variety of differentials that can contribute to that presentation that I'd like to discuss here. Many endocrine abnormalities can contribute to this type of proximal muscle weakness. The ones that we would consider and be able to potentially rule out in this case include derangement of the thyroid. Both hypo and hyperthyroidism can contribute to proximal muscle weakness and the patient has a normal TSH. So we can feel fairly confident that this is not likely in this case. Hyperparathyroidism, because of its uh, etiology in relation to serum calcium, can also contribute to muscle weakness, secondary derangements in calcium. Uh, I'll speak about calcium shortly. The patient has no prior history of diabetes, and usually muscle weakness in the setting of diabetes would be associated with proximal muscle pain and weakness, usually in the lower extremities. Adrenal disorders, such as primary hyperaldosteronism, can also lead to proximal muscle weakness, and disorders of the pituitary can similarly lead to weakness as well. Other causes that I think are interesting to consider but are less likely include inflammatory processes, which usually are associated with a sensation of muscle pain, such as myalgias, or with rashes. Paramneoplastic syndromes that contribute to muscle weakness also usually are associated with muscle pain and myalgias. The patient has had diarrhea for the last three days, but the most common infectious etiologies that contribute to subsequent muscle weakness uh, such as Coxsackie virus B or HIV seem less likely in this particular patient. Finally, drugs and toxins are known to cause uh, muscle weakness and myopathy. There's no literature to support that fluoxetine, either in overdose or in withdrawal, would contribute to this type of presentation. Finally, there are a number of metabolic etiologies that can contribute to muscle weakness. Those include hypokalemia, which I think is worth us uh, reviewing again in the setting of the findings on the patient's EKG, which may be indicative of hypokalemia. Hyperkalemia can also lead to muscle weakness, but we don't see findings of that on the EKG. Hypocalcemia can lead to muscle weakness and can also cause a prolonged QT as we see in this particular patient. However, in that setting, the patient would likely have increased muscle tone and increased reflexes as well as tetany. Hypomagnesemia similarly usually is associated with muscle weakness associated with tetany. Hypophosphatemia can also contribute to muscle weakness and can occur in the setting of diarrhea, but it's usually a chronic prolonged course of diarrhea that can contribute to hypophosphatemia. And we don't know the results of that uh, laboratory study in this particular patient at this time. Finally, vitamin D deficiency and its related impact on calcium can contribute to muscle weakness. Given that differential diagnosis for proximal muscle weakness, I'd like to look closely at the salient features that the patient is presenting with in the emergency department, as well as the differential that we have in front of us for proximal muscle weakness. Very often in emergency medicine, when we have an acute presentation such as what we're seeing here, we often go to patterns of muscle weakness that we learn about that are part of the core content of emergency medicine. And I've listed some of those here on the right-hand side of the slide. Things that I'd like to consider and discuss would be botulism, Guillain-Barre syndromes, hypokalemic, periodic paralysis, myasthenia gravis, tick paralysis, and transverse myelitis. The reason that I think that these etiologies are less likely in this patient are the following. Botulism usually presents with bulbar muscular weakness and ophthalmoplegia before it uh, extends to further uh, diffuse trunk and limb weakness making botulism less likely in this particular patient. His cranial nerve examination is normal. The Guillain-Barre syndromes are numerous, often presenting with an ascending paralysis uh, and sometimes with sensory findings in addition to the muscle weakness. Despite that, 
the presentation of Guillain-Barre syndromes usually is not so acute as what we're seeing here in the course of several hours. Usually is something that occurs over the course of several days with the nadir occurring anywhere from days to a week after the onset of symptoms. Hypokalemic periodic paralysis is a very rare condition that can contribute to sudden attacks of muscle weakness and paralysis. This is a very appealing differential diagnosis for us to consider, given the fact that the patient has a long QT interval that would be suggestive of hypokalemia. Also, because familial hypokalemic periodic paralysis is something that is ruled out through a history of the patient's family, and we are unable to obtain that history, this might be something that we might be drawn to in this setting. Myasthenia gravis, uh, also a neuromuscular junction um, disease, can contribute to muscle weakness, but is not usually so acute in onset as what we are seeing here in this particular case. We have no uh, reason to suggest that the patient has been exposed to ticks, nor on our physical examination have we been told that the patient has an embedded tick uh, in his skin, and so I think that that is unlikely. Finally, transverse myelitis usually presents with a sensory level and sensation of back pain that is associated with the patient's progressive weakness. Given these findings, we're left with thinking about adrenal etiologies for muscle weakness and hypokalemia, as well as the diagnosis of familial hypokalemic periodic paralysis. I'd like to talk more about that because it's usually associated with certain characteristics of the patient's behavior that contribute to a shift in the serum potassium leading to weakness. Usually periodic paralysis is caused by shifts in potassium either associated with a large carbohydrate load or with exertion or, or uh, heavy exercise. We have no history to suggest that in this patient, and though that is an interesting potential differential for this patient's presentation, I'd like to think more closely about other causes for hypokalemia that would be uh, in line with the other salient features in this patient. I'd like to draw your attention to the lower aspect of this slide, which lists some of the other uh, information about this patient that we should consider as we start to uh, consider the etiology for his presentation. First of all, the patient has been having diarrhea for the last several days, and although this could lead to derangements in his potassium, it's unlikely to be the sole factor contributing to his presentation. The rapid onset of his symptoms is, is notable, uh, and does indicate that the diarrhea itself may have been an acute etiology complicating some other subacute factor uh, that had not been previously diagnosed in this patient. As we start to look at the other findings that were remarkable in this case, I do believe that the patient's elevated blood pressure contributes to our understanding of the potential etiology for his presentation. The elevated opening pressure is also very interesting and as we look back to potential adrenal causes of why this person could have muscle weakness, I'd like to relate the normal function of the adrenal gland and some of the findings that we see in this particular patient. First of all, in adrenal disease, especially adrenal hyperplasia or secreting adrenal adenomas, if patients have elevated levels of aldosterone, we know that this deranges the normal balance between sodium and potassium, contributing to hypokalemia in these patients. They also have, sorry, can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, I heard noise. Um, they also can have elevated cortisol levels, which can contribute to elevated blood pressure, depression, and obesity. And intracranial hypertension has been associated with Cushing syndrome. Given these findings and the hypokalemia that we suspect in the long QT in this patient's EKG, as well as the evidence of uh, elevated muscle breakdown with an elevated CK, my suggestion is that the likely etiology for this patient's presentation is some disorder of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, specifically at the level of the adrenal gland. My question is whether hyperadrenalism as a subacute etiology may have been complicated by an overlying acute gastroenteritis contributing to profound hypokalemia in this young gentleman who has no known family history, but has presenting findings of elevated blood pressure, obesity, 
elevated opening pressure, a long QT suggestive of hypokalemia. And uh, my suggestion is that the likely diagnostic study, which was performed in the emergency department, was a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, which I expect may have showed evidence of either bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, uh, adrenal adenoma, or other mass, or possibly even uh, pancreatic mass uh, that would be a neuroendocrine tumor. In that differential diagnosis, I would suggest that pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors usually are insulinomas or glucagon secreting or uh, vasoactive intestinal peptide secreting tumors. They do have the ability to contribute to many of the findings that we see with adrenal adenomas that are secreting aldosterone and cortisol, but would be uh, within the differential for this particular case. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Farrell. A uh, very complex case, um, definitely a few things that don't make it seamless or easy. So this will be the conclusion to the presentation I just gave. I'd like to recap much of the same things that Dr. Farrell highlighted. So we have an 18-year-old male, so relatively young, painless, bilateral muscle weakness, decreased reflexes, seemingly rapid onset over a few hours, perhaps over the previous few days. The first episode was in the teenage years. We know that there is preceding gastrointestinal symptoms, so diarrhea for a few days and more recently vomiting. We can tell that there's prominent U waves in the precordial leads, long QT intervals with fusion of the T and U waves, normal cytology, but elevated ICP. Putting that all together, there's really one test which Dr. Farrell highlighted uh, would need to be done that will sense this diagnosis. And so if we look at this image here and we zoom, zoom a little bit closer, then we're gonna enhance that image. We're gonna enhance even further. There's only one test and it's gonna be a repeat of Istat or chemistry revealing a potassium of 1.4, which is suggestive of hypokalemic periodic paralysis. A difficult diagnosis, it looks like Dr. Farrell came down to one of two, and admittedly, there's heavy overlap between the two presentations. So we'll see how that pays off. The differential diagnosis is broad. For this weakness, there's many things in someone 18 years old that could cause this type of weakness. However, a thorough neurologic exam, which was performed, helps tease out some of these diagnoses. For example, Guillain-Barre, there wasn't a recent illness, viral or otherwise, the CSF protein wasn't elevated. For acute transverse myelitis, there was no sensory level that was highlighted. The weakness was acute, and then there is no other bowel bladder dysfunction, certainly no pain. Botulism also seems possible, possible but less likely given the symmetric paralysis, or excuse me, given that there is no cranial nerve involvement. Other things that have to be considered when we see this EKG, which is so highly suggestive of hypokalemia, is this simply from gastrointestinal losses? Is this patient on diuretics? We really had no reason to believe that. Hyperaldosteronism, something that obviously must be considered and truthfully can't fully be ruled out in a simple single emergency department visit. And then others such as metabolic or respiratory alkalosis. I think part of what makes this case so tough is that outside of the primary neurologic uh, etiologies, there's heavy overlay and interlap between causes of hypokalemia. A simple gastrointestinal illness could make diuretic hypokalemia worse. It could exacerbate hyperaldosteronism, or it could be the trigger for hypokalemic periodic paralysis. So what is hypokalemic periodic paralysis? Not much is known part, in part because of how rare it is. We do know it's familial, as Dr. Uh, Farrell mentioned, it's a mutation typically in a calcium or sodium channel skeletal muscle that in fact makes up 90% of the known cases. So interestingly, a secondary channelopathy, there's no direct problem with the potassium channels, rather ones that leads to abnormalities. Ultimately, the clinical presentation is a combination of both generalized weakness, typically pretty onset, and I say generalized, really proximal weakness predominantly, and hypokalemia. Again, the prevalence is quite rare, one in 100,000. ER doctors really come in two forms, those that like zebras and those that don't. This is definitely a zebra. Typically, 
familial, as I mentioned, autosomal dominant, which makes the lack of family history in this patient tough. So clinical features, typically the first episode is in childhood or teenage years, and then patients go on tip often to have numerous episodes, though some just have a few. Bit triggered by exercise, high co carbohydrate diet or stress. There's no history of exercise or certainly no history of high co carbohydrate diet that we may just have not receive that information. Now, whether or not there is stress, that's perhaps the most subjective finding of them all. A few days of diarrhea certainly would be more stressful to some than others. The generalized weakness worse in the lower extremities and proximal muscles and hyporeflexia is common. The cranial nerves are spared as we discussed and the onset was over hours or a few days. We obviously didn't see this in the emergency room, but a complete resolution is typical of these. So what is the treatment? It's quite simple. There's really only a few pitfalls. You have to treat with potassium and then magnesium if that is low as well. What further confounds this picture, and which is why we truly can't say with 100% certainty this isn't an alternative diagnosis, is that typically the potassium is about 2.5 in hypokalemic periodic paralysis unless there's an additional cause uh, leading to low potassium. And by additional cause, gastrointestinal losses or diuretics or some of the other things that were mentioned. So the fact that this patient's potassium is 1.4 does in fact that there's something a little bit more than just hypokalemic periodic paralysis. Treatment 60 to 120 milliequivalents orally, continue that over and over again. And then it has been documented in several case series that hyper and overcorrection and hyperkalemia has happened in a handful of cases. So that's something to look out for. Don't administer dextrose with this because that can be one of the handful of stressors that actually exacerbates symptoms. Cardiac monitoring obviously would be important. So for this patient, he got Zofran and Farragan for his vomiting. He did get some oral potassium, intravenous potassium, and some magnesium. Two hours later, while in the emergency department, it only slightly increased 1.7, but was moving in the right trajectory. This was this first, Another thing which highlights how difficult this case was, this is this patient's first presentation. So really there is no history to go off of that this is something that's been going to happen recurrently. So he was admitted with a neurology consult. Patient did end up receiving an MRI of the head, spine, and abdomen, which goes to Dr. Farrell's suggestion of an abdomen imaging. Patient had treatment resistant hypokalemia over the next two days, but was discharged with normal potassium and had complete recovery. I, I think this case was interesting and worth presenting because it highlights a few things. One, there's often many red herrings in a presentation. Didn't really discuss what was the elevated ICP from, you know, was the patient having an intracranial hemorrhage or was there, there another infection such as meningitis or encephalitis? There wasn't much else to suggest that was the case. Sometimes we just get an abnormal lab value. Another thing I think is worth highlighting for the emergency department provider in this case is that I think any emergency doctor who sees this case is going to admit this patient, they're gonna get an consult, and they're gonna get a, the million dollar workup. Because unless you know that the patient has hypokalemic periodic paralysis, you can't rely on the fact that a low potassium is the sole cause of all these symptoms. However, I think that also highlights the importance for an ER doctor to know about this presentation, this case, because Every time this happens again, if you're unaware of this and you don't know about this patient's history, you're going to perform that million dollar workup unnecessarily. And so that's going to be unnecessary lumbar punctures, unnecessary MRIs, hospital days. So a very important diagnosis to, make, to understand. That's all I have today, and I thank you all for your time.